Good morning. Welcome to Widener Law Commonwealth. I'm Michael Hussey, Dean of the Law School here. It's a pleasure to have all of you on campus this morning for our fourth annual Emergency Services uh, Law and Policy Symposium. So it's really great to see all of you here. It's great um, to be back in person like we were last year um, and enjoying each other's company as we go through this. Um, at the law school, we have two initiatives that are interrelated. We have our Veterans Initiative and our First Responders Initiative that came out of the Veterans Initiative. And so we're very focused here at the law school on serving those who served. We, as a part of those initiatives, provide them with academic counseling, financial aid counseling, and career counseling so that they can be where they wanna be um, in their careers and, and taking that forward. And so it's really a opportunity for us to guide them, mentor them and support them during their time here at the law school so that they're successful both in school and afterwards. And in particular, I'd like to thank Doug Wolfborg for his efforts in supporting and organizing this symposium, symposium every year. He has been a wonderful supporter of the law school over many, many years. So thank you, Doug. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Johnson, who has some remarks for all of us as well. My remarks will be brief. Uh, it's terrific to be here. Uh, this symposium came out of some conversations that Doug and I had probably five years ago. And we had, start, we had spent a lot of time and energy at the school recognizing the contribution that veterans make. And as Doug and I were talking, we realized here at the local level, the importance of strengthening and working with our EMS and, and first responders here and to see how the law school could contribute by providing a forum to talk about all of these important issues. And this absolutely would not have happened without Doug and his, uh, his law firm, uh, Paige Wol uh, Wolberg and, and Worth. And we're really thankful for their sponsorship and energy and time that they've uh, they put in behind it. And as as all of you have been involved in the emergency uh, medical services and first responders appreciate, there's always people back there that are helping things to, to function and to work. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, PCN in particular for them coming and for basically exponentially expanding the reach of this particular conference. It's really nice that we, we're all here in person, but the broadcast statewide that we can make additional inputs through, uh, through PCN. We're thankful for our, uh, our uh, Employees here at uh, Widener, Brian Fernbaugh, Bob Dolman, Mark Hughes, Molly Ackery, and all the others that are here to, to make everything work so smoothly and well. And Doug and I, of course, want to thank Corinna Wilson, who's uh, our driving organizational, organizational force that, that makes this happen and keeps everything together. Finally, we also like to recognize the Ambulance Association of Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania Fire and Emergency Services Institute for their support and, and help with the program. And so without any further comments, I'd now like to introduce Doug Wolpert. Good morning. I was looking for a mouse to try to get that stuff off the top of the screen, but I see no mouse. So I think we're gonna have to live with it. So I, I wanna thank uh, Dean Hussey and Professor Johnson and the law school uh, for once again organizing and holding this event and all of you uh, for coming. I know some of you traveled some distance, uh, some of you didn't, but that's fine. It's great to have everybody here, whether you're here for the CLE or the update on what's happening in EMS or both. Uh, we have a lot of a wide array of material uh, to talk about uh, today. Uh, Professor Johnson mentioned the supporting organization, so I don't have to repeat that other than, other than to sincerely thank, again, those organizations. Uh, despite how kind uh, Professor Johnson was uh, to acknowledge the work of our firm in this, I really want to acknowledge Professor Johnson and Corinna Wilson, who very much are the driving forces uh, for this program, and we're now in our fourth annual, can you believe it? Uh, so uh, it is uh, really a testament to the law school uh, for the support that they show to the first responder community, uh, to veterans, to the military, uh, and, and that really speaks volumes. I think with all of the law schools out there, 
uh, I think the commitment that uh, Widener Commonwealth law has to those communities is unparalleled. So uh, I very much appreciate uh, that. So the first uh, topic that we have on tap this morning, we've got today a mix of state and federal law issues. And we're going to start off with this issue under federal law um, about two really kind of pressing issues that have become nationally pretty big challenges for EMS systems. And those are the issues of hospital bed delays. So these prolonged wait times that ambulances are experiencing in emergency departments, which is having a lot of ripple effects uh, throughout the EMS system. And then the related issue of ambulance diversions from one emergency department to another emergency department. And we're gonna talk about how both of those things are intertwined with the federal law known as EMTALA and how that law sort of applies to both of those issues. So that's what we're going to uh, start off with this morning and talk about EMTALA through the lens of these two issues of uh, emergency department bed delays and ambulance diversions. I do want to also note for the legal folks in the audience that uh, EMTALA, the federal law, is currently sort of the subject of some federal litigation uh, because after the Dobbs decision, it is, uh, it is being used by the federal government to, uh, to remind hospitals of their duty to provide emergency care. And in states that have outlawed abortion, the question then becomes, whether or not a procedure necessary to save the life of a pregnant woman in an emergency department would be uh, permitted under federal law or, or whether that would preempt uh, inconsistent state laws. So and there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on around MTALA right now. And its primary purpose is to uh, ensure that hospital emergency departments provide emergency care to anyone who comes to that hospital and seeks emergency care. So that's why it has become sort of a focal point in the post-Dobbs uh, world that it will be very interesting to see how that sort of plays out. So that's a little bit of a legal note uh, before we get back to the EMS uh, issues. So the first of these two big issues that we're going to talk about with reference to EMTALA is the issue of emergency department bed delays. And, you know, a lot of folks call this a lot of different things uh, without being hospital bashers necessarily. I mean, we're an EMS oriented law firm. And of course, many of our clients do hospital based EMS. But this really is primarily an issue of delays in EMS turning over care to hospital emergency departments. So that terminology uh, that we sort of consistently use is the issue of hospital bed delays. But another term that is often used is prolonged ambulance patient offload time. So it's not that we didn't have enough abbreviations and acronyms in EMS, but APOT is another one that's becoming pretty commonly used. And that's the interval between the arrival of the ambulance at the hospital emergency department and the time when that ambulance returns, pardon me, returns to service, is available for the next call in the community. And these prolonged APOT times are typically, not always, but the result of hospital staff uh, not accepting physical transfer of care of a patient until they have staff available to do that. So these are not just hospitals making ambulances wait for the fun of it, right? This is typically because the hospitals are also overburdened. And if they don't have clinical staff immediately available to provide care, the net result of that is that the ambulances are uh, waiting with these patients uh, in the ambulance hallways. And another industry term that has evolved for that practice is called wall time, because the ambulances are usually waiting with the stretchers against the wall of a, of a hallway in the ER with a patient still on the ambulance stretcher. So a lot of folks in our industry call that wall time. Uh, and the other problem is ambulance diversion, which is when an ambulance is bringing a patient to an emergency department, but is then redirected or given an instruction to take the patient to another facility because the emergency department lacks the staff or the resources to take care of more emergency patients. So 
please go somewhere else is, is the diversionary request that ambulances are often on the receiving end. So both of these uh, problems, uh, when we have both diversion requests and long offload times, what the net effect of that or the cumulative effect in some cases, because you can be both diverted and then have a long offload time when you get to the destination hospital. The net effect or cumulative effect of those issues is that every unit hour or portion of a unit hour that an ambulance spends either driving around looking for an emergency department that will take the patient or waiting on the wall in the emergency department is a unit hour or portion of it where that ambulance is not in service for the community to respond to future 911 calls. So that has a, a sort of a, you know, a negative effect on the provision of emergency care within the community. All right, so now let's shift into federal law and start nerding out on what federal law says about these issues. And TAL is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. It was passed by Congress as part of the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act in 1985. Some people took to calling it COBRA, but since that was a consolidated law, there were about half a billion things that were addressed in COBRA, uh, like our rights to continuation of health care when we change jobs, right, all that stuff. So we call it MTALA. That is the portion of COBRA that deals with this. So this is a federal statute. It applies to all Medicare participating hospitals, which is virtually all acute care hospitals, of course, in the United States. And it is overseen and enforced by CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is also the same agency that pays or doesn't all of the Medicare claims for ambulance services, right? And EMTALA does permit civil suits against hospitals. There is no private right of action against physicians. However, the law permit civil monetary penalties to be assessed by CMS against physicians. So there are a mix of civil and administrative enforcement mechanisms in the law, and we'll do a case study on that uh, in a few minutes. So the law was originally passed as a result of a lot of media horror stories, particularly arising in big cities, uh, where patients would present to emergency departments of often private hospitals and the first procedure that would be done, uh, and sometimes these patients would have emergency conditions, but the ones that caught the headlines were uh, patients in active labor. And the first medical procedure was the wallet biopsy, right, where the private hospital would determine if the patient had insurance or means to pay. And prior to the passage of Imtala, and it, uh, it was passed in 85, took effect in 86, there was no federal legal duty on the part of hospitals to take those patients. And as a result, there were a lot of stories of patients giving birth in waiting rooms or in the back of a taxi or, you know, all of these uh, stories. And a lot of them seem to come out of the city of Chicago. That seemed to be the incubator, uh, the cradle of Mtala, if you will. So what, what I'm going to do is take a few minutes to walk through the pertinent sections of the statute and the regulations and then a little bit of the agency guidance that speaks to these issues. And MTALA has a lot more to say about a variety of areas, but we're going to focus on the ones that relate to the EMS issues. So first, let's start with the statute. There is the citation. Uh, if any of you have insomnia, you can put that citation in your Googler, start reading it. You're welcome. You'll be asleep in no time. But, and by the way, you do have to be of a certain vintage to understand that cartoon, right? I see a few heads going, yeah, a couple going, oh, what's that, right? All right, you can, we'll talk about that one later. All right, so by the way, we do have uh, electronic uh, copies of this available. Uh, if you want to get a copy of these handouts, since some of these slides are pretty dense and I couldn't imagine anybody having to feverishly take notes uh, with all this material, but we will be happy to provide those to you. You can see uh, any of us from PWW and we'll make sure we get those to you. The first and primary requirement is that hospitals have to perform a medical screening examination, an MSE, on patients who come to the emergency department. And uh, that duty, that legal duty applies when the patient, and this is the magic phrase, 
comes to the emergency department. Now, when this law passed, I was an EMT, I was working in the field, and I remember reading it. I was not yet a lawyer. I was just a station house lawyer, right? The EMT who thought he knew everything about the law, but in reality knew nothing, right? We all know those folks. And I remember reading it going, okay, well, if I bring a patient to a hospital physically, they have to take care of the patient. And this phrase comes to the hospital has been the subject of a lot of litigation, regulations, and agency guidance uh, because it is not that cut and dry that physical presence is the, in the hospital is the only mechanism that gives rise to this duty. It's also important to note that even though EMTALA is a statute that's part of the Medicare conditions of participation for hospitals, this is not applicable only to Medicare beneficiaries. Medicare is the hook that the statute uses to make this requirement applicable to hospitals, but the requirement applies to anyone who comes to the emergency department, regardless of whether they're insured by Medicare and regardless of their ability to pay. So even if they are uninsured, this statute and the duties that it entails apply to the hospitals. Now, the purpose of this medical screening exam is to determine if an emergency medical condition exists. And the law, and we'll, we'll put the definition up briefly, has a rather detailed definition of what an emergency medical condition is. Active labor is a per se emergency medical condition under the statute. Importantly, please note that if the hospital does the medical screening examination and it is found that the patient does not have an emergency medical condition, the hospital's obligations under EMTALA are satisfied. And if they, to use the colloquialism, kick the patient to the curb, it is no longer an EMTALA violation. It may well be a medical malpractice violation under state law that could be actionable in a civil case, but the EMTALA duties are satisfied if the hospital does the medical screening exam and determines that the patient does not have an emergency medical condition. Now, if the hospital determines through a proper medical screening exam that the patient does have an emergency medical condition, as I promise we will define, the uh, hospital must then provide stabilizing treatment to the patient. Now, I'll nerd out on the law here for a second. That is essentially a subjective standard on what stabilizing treatment consists of because EMTALA does not impose a national standard of care. It can't because hospitals have different capabilities. You can't say that a hospital has to do neurosurgery to stabilize an emergency patient if they have no neurosurgeon, right? So what EMTALA says is that within the capabilities of the hospital, they must provide stabilizing care or treatment to the patient if an emergency medical condition is identified. The other option that EMTALA has, that hospitals have under EMTALA, is to do what is termed a proper transfer, right? So there, there, are the, there is the ability to transfer a patient to another facility if the hospital certifies that the benefits of that transfer outweigh the risk. So in other words, we don't have the capabilities that the patient needs to stabilize them. They need to go to another hospital for that stabilization. EMTALA also has, but let me back up one second. If the hospital does have the capability to provide the stabilizing treatment to the patient, they must provide that. And they cannot transfer the patient except in those circumstances where the stabilizing treatment is beyond their capability. For that reason, this law is also colloquially referred to as the patient anti-dumping law, uh, which sometimes you hear that referred to in the media. Now, EMTALA does have provisions in it for the patient or their legally responsible decision maker to refuse that care or to leave the hospital against medical advice. The hospital has some obligations to attempt to obtain a signature and informed consent for that refusal of services, but it does allow for patient or responsible decision maker decision making in those cases. If the hospital has stabilizing capabilities and the individual is not yet stabilized, transfers out of that patient are restricted until the stabilizing treatment is provided. So again, that is the anti, so-called anti-dumping provision 
uh, of the statute. If the patient has an unstable condition and the stabilization treatment is beyond the hospital's capability, the attending physician from that hospital must sign a transfer certification certifying that the benefits of the transfer outweigh the risks. So only in those circumstances can a hospital under EMTALA transfer an unstable patient, okay? So that is a narrow limitation to the hospital's requirement to keep that patient and provide stabilizing care. Parenthetically, the statute also imposes obligations on the hospital to make appropriate arrangements for a transfer if it is one of those subcategories of patients for whom a transfer outweighs the risks. And that is that the hospital has to select the appropriate transfer resource and level of care. If that's a ground ambulance, if that's an air ambulance, if it's ALS or advanced life support or basic life support, the hospital has to properly make that determination based on the needs of the, of the patient. And I point this out because on more than one occasion, EMS agencies have been asked to transfer patients that might well be beyond the scope of practice of the providers in that ambulance. And if that is the case, the ambulance providers should be aware that they should either request additional personnel from that hospital to accompany the patient when needed, or they could, in some circumstances, if they believe they do not have the capacity to treat that patient, refuse that transport until appropriate levels of care are available during that transport. There are cases where EMS agencies have been found liable for accepting transports and interhospital transfers of patients that were beyond their capacity. So that is a footnote or a parenthetical to that part of EMTALA. Okay, so they have to choose the right resource and the right personnel to affect that transport. As promised or as threatened, take it as you will, here is the definition of an emergency medical condition. Uh, it is wordy, but it is somewhat like a prudent layperson definition, but it's a little different. It says, it's a condition manifesting itself by acute symptoms of sufficient severity uh, including pain, which is itself a triggering symptom under EMTALA, such that the absence of immediate medical attention could reasonably be expected to result in placing the health of the individual or an unborn child in serious jeopardy, serious impairment to bodily functions, serious dysfunction of any bodily organ or part, or a pregnant woman essentially, as I said, is a per se emergency medical condition. So the definition of an emergency medical condition is rather expansive, as you can see. And as lawyers, we know that whenever we see the term reasonable, get out the truck, because that's, you know, you can drive the truck through the term, right? But that is the definition of an emergency medical condition. And by the way, in case you're wondering what stabilize means, it means that it's the treatment necessary to prevent material deterioration of the patient's condition. Hospitals, of course, cannot be guarantors of that fact because that decision is beyond any medical provider's pay grade. Uh, but that is the standard for what it means to provide stabilizing treatment uh, to the patient. Okay, before we move on from the statute to the regulations, does anybody have any questions or comments they would like to ask or add? this point. Yes, ma'am. Yes, let me repeat the question. If the patient requires care, but the family or the patient, and that always depends on who's the competent decision maker who has the legal capacity, uh, does that end the hospital's EMTALA obligations? Yes, with an asterisk, the hospital's remaining duty is to make a reasonable effort to obtain a signed informed consent of that refusal of care. And if they do that, doesn't mean they have to get the signature, but they have to make the, the attempt. I would always hope that a hospital would document that attempt if it wasn't successful, and then that does discharge their EMTALA obligations. Any other questions? Yes, sir. 
That, yeah, it's a great question. The question is, if the hospital is sending the patient out because they lack the capability to provide the stabilizing treatment, can, does the ambulance service, service have financial recourse back to the hospital? Uh, is there anything in EMTALA that says that? Great question. There we go, using logic, reasoning, and common sense to uh, ask questions about a federal program. Uh, no, EMTALA has no obligations to transfer financial responsibility to the sending facilities when the services, when the transfer is necessary because it exceeds the hospital's capabilities. There is a provision in buried in the deep in one of the Medicare manuals that talks about financial responsibility for transfers between hospitals, and it pr provides a three-part test for financial responsibility. In some cases under that test, hospitals may be financially responsible for ambulance transports, but that is not, that is completely separate from EMTALA. Yeah, so it's great. Great question. Uh, any others? Take one more if there is one more at this stage. Yes. Sir. Yes. Yeah, let me repeat the question. Is there a component of MTALA that requires the receiving facility to accept? Great question. The answer is yes. That does not come from the statute or even the regulations. It comes from CMS's interpretive guidance that they interpret MTALA to impose a duty on receiving facilities if that uh, care is within their capability or their specialty. So if I'm sending out a patient with certain kind of heart attack called a STEMI, for example, and the receiving facility is a STEMI center or a stroke center or whatever it is, they do have the obligation and, and CMS would consider that an EMTALA violation on the part of the receiving hospital if they refuse uh, to accept the patient. Okay, great questions. We'll move on. I'm sure we'll have a few more minutes for a few other questions. Do appreciate those questions. It's, a, it's the uh, public speaker equivalent of a pulse check in EMS, right? All right, so next let's talk about the ambulance-related regulations. This phrase, as I mentioned, comes to the emergency department, uh, is interpreted in a few ways. One is, of course, physical presence at the emergency department. And that is that triggers the hospital's duty in two ways. One is if the patient asks for care, or the second is if any reasonable person looking at the patient would presume they need it, right? So there's a reasonableness standard in there as well, because not all patients can verbalize that request uh, when they come to an emergency uh, department. And by the way, in, in my commentary box off to the right here, you can see that it, it does not matter how the patient got to that emergency department. Private vehicle, they walked in, a friend brought them in, an ambulance brought them in, the physical presence of the patient triggers the hospital's duty in the emergency department. Now, EMTALA also speaks to the presentation of a hospital on other parts and other departments of the hospital, not the emergency department. So if a patient shows up at an on-campus clinic that's separate from the main hospital, for example, the hospital does have duties. And even though, let's say, the cashier at the coffee shop doesn't have the legal responsibility to perform the medical screening examination, which is probably good policy. The hospital does have to have procedures in place to get that patient to its emergency department so that that medical screening examination can, can take place. And I know some of you are saying, yeah, their plan is to call us, right? Because sometimes EMS does get those calls to move patients from other on-campus locations into emergency departments. Now, interestingly, here's where EMTALA starts to get quite expansive for EMS. If the hospital owns and operates an ambulance, the ambulance that picks up the patient, that is considered hospital property and the patient is deemed to have come to the hospital for that purpose, for EMTALA. So a hospital owned and operated ambulance, whether ground or air, is considered hospital property and the EMTALA obligations apply. Now. The government also, the feds also say 
that the personnel in that ambulance are not credentialed or should not be credentialed to do the medical screening examination. So generally that hospital owned ambulance needs to bring the patient back to the ambulance, to the hospital that owns the ambulance so that the medical screening examination can be done. So hospital owned and operated ambulances are hospital property. Now, uh, there are a few exceptions to that rule if the ambulance is following a protocol, for example, a clinical protocol. So the example is if it's a community hospital that owns the ambulance, but the patient in the back meets a protocol to go to a destination hospital that's accredited for certain kinds of conditions, stroke, STEMI, trauma, or the three big ones, that ambulance can bypass its own hospital and go to the accredited specialty facility when a, when a clinical protocol directs that to happen. And then there is um, another exception for online medical control. So when a physician gives an order to go to a different hospital, the hospital-owned ambulance can follow that in some cases. Now, most ambulances in the United States are not owned and operated by hospitals. So let's look at what the regulations say about non-hospital-owned and operated ambulances. And by the way, um, these regulations, we've all met, many of us in the room have heard the saying, hard facts make bad law. And these regulations come from the tortured case out of the Seventh Circuit called Johnson versus University of Chicago Hospital. So time does not allow us to, to talk about that case in detail, other than to say it was a very ill-advised Seventh Circuit decision. The Seventh Circuit uh, quite remarkably withdrew its own decision, sua sponte, which you very rarely see. Uh, and then CMS stepped in and promulgated these regulations in direct response to the facts of the Johnson case which is why these regulations are kind of weird, all right? Now, if the individual is in an ambulance not owned by the hospital or a hospital, okay? And not, um, well, first off, if they are physically on the hospital's property, the hospital's MTALA obligations kick in when the non-hospital owned and operated ambulance is physically on the hospital's property, okay? We'll talk about hospital property in a moment. Actually, we'll talk about it right now. Hospital property is defined, as you see here, it is essentially the main building and the contiguous buildings on the hospital's campus, and interestingly, areas located within 250 yards of that campus. That bizarre rule comes from a case out of Chicago dealing with the Ravenswood Hospital in a case where a young man was shot in a drive-by shooting. His friends took him to the alley outside the hospital, banged on the door, said, we need help, and no one from the hospital would come outside to take care of the patient uh, and told him to call 911, and the young man died. So this was put into the regulations as a result of another Chicago, I told you it was the incubator of Impala folks, uh, uh, called the Ravenswood Hospital case. So that is the so-called 250-yard rule. Now, if a patient in a non-hospital owned and operated ambulance is off the hospital's property, they are not considered to have come to the emergency department. And because of the facts of the Johnson versus University of Chicago Hospitals case, the regulation went on to say even if a member of the ambulance crew contacts the hospital by phone or radio and tells them they want to bring the patient to that hospital. As you might now be guessing, in the Johnson versus University of Chicago Hospitals case, the Seventh Circuit ruled that radio contact by an ambulance to an emergency department triggered the hospital's MTALA obligations, that that radio contact was the same as coming to the hospital. And a lot of hospitals started getting out of the online medical command business saying, don't call us, we're not gonna answer, right? Because that significantly extended the reach of Mtala to anywhere a phone or a radio would take it. That's why the Seventh Circuit withdrew their opinion and CMS subsequently promulgated this regulation to say expressly overruling Johnson versus UCH that radio or telemetry contact with a hospital does not constitute coming to the hospital or a triggering of the hospital's Mtala obligations. Now, 
they couldn't leave well enough alone. They went on to write this in the regulation that has also been the subject of much litigation. If the hospital lacks the staff or facilities to accept additional emergency patients, it may determine or declare itself to be on diversionary status. And it can tell the incoming non-hospital owned ambulance that we lack the staff or facilities to take any additional emergency patients and we are on diversionary status. Oh, can't forget this. Right in the regulation. If however, the ambulance staff disregards the hospital's diversionary instruction and comes to the emergency department, the hospital's MTAL obligations apply. So what we know already about diversionary orders is that they are requests, okay? So we'll come back to that because that's important. So this issue of diversionary orders, some systems across country call it different things, ER diversion, bypass, reroute, whatever it's called, is at the end of the day a request. And it is clear that the hospital has a legal obligation to accept and provide the medical screening examination to the patient once physical presence on the hospital property is achieved. Now, the regs do talk about who has to perform that medical screening examination. Usually that has to be a physician. The hospital can credential some non-physicians such as uh, OB nurses, for example, when a patient presents directly to OB to do those medical screening examinations, but typically it should not and cannot be a paramedic or an EMT. Okay, now let us do our uh, case study here on Amtala and uh, talk briefly about the case of Arrington versus Wong. This is a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case decided back in 2001. Uh, Mr. Arrington was 69 years old. He was driving to work and experienced sudden onset of uh, severe shortness of breath. Uh, a non-hospital owned ambulance was called by his coworkers when he got to work. When EMS arrived, they uh, recorded a history of a sudden onset of sudden dyspnea or shortness of breath. He had a history of hypertension. He was found uh, kneeling into a couch on the floor. His pulse was elevated. Uh, he had what's called sinus tachycardia uh, and his blood pressure was also elevated. But notably, his respiratory rate was 50 times a minute. And for the non-clinical folks in here, uh, just count how many times you breathe for a minute and then get back to me on whether that's a lot, all right? It is. So it was a pretty elevated respiratory rate. And the medics had a, uh, an idea here or a clinical impression that he either had congestive heart failure uh, or myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. They initiated treatment, the details of which are not uh, critical to our understanding of the case. And they began to transport the patient to a hospital called Queens Medical Center or QMC. This is Honolulu, by the way, in case you're wondering where this arose. At 24 hours after, or 24 minutes after midnight, and at a minute later, they got on the radio and spoke to the ER doc at uh, Queens named Dr. Wong. They said this, we're coming to your facility, 69-year-old male patient, he's in severe respiratory distress, his respiration rate is high, and we gave him some meds and all that other stuff. Dr. Wong responds to that by saying, okay, what's his name and who's his doctor? Which some EMS providers in the room are going, really? That's, that's your question, right? And they said, patient is a Tripler patient, which meant he normally was seen at Tripler Army Hospital, another facility in Honolulu, that's about five miles further away. But they said, since he was in severe respiratory distress, we thought we'd come to a closer facility. They expressly told Dr. Wong that. Well, Dr. Wong said, if you gave him the albuterol and the Lasix, I think it's okay, go ahead and take him to Tripler. Okay, we'll take him to Tripler then. So we could certainly say there are questions of fact and law about whether that exchange constituted a diversionary instruction, okay? But we can put a pin in that, in that issue. Tripler was five miles further away. Mr. Arrington went into cardiac arrest about two minutes after arriving and he did not survive. His estate filed suit naming Dr. Wong, his medical group, Queens, and the two EMS crew members. Now remember, MTALA does not permit civil suits against anybody other than hospitals. So of course, joined with the federal MTALA claim are state law medical malpractice claims uh, that would normally be brought in state court. 
trial court dismisses the complaint, ruling that it is undisputed that Mr. Arrington, um, uh, Mr. Arrington had never physically arrived at the Queens Medical Center Emergency Department, and that they drew a bright line that physical presence was required at the hospital to trigger the hospital's EMTALA obligations. Ninth Circuit reverses the trial court, finding that Queens did violate the EMTALA regulations that we just talked about, ruling that Dr. Wong's statement could reasonably have been interpreted by the crew as a diversionary instruction. But importantly, Queens Hospital never argued or was ever able to show that at the time Dr. Wong said what he said, that they were on diversionary status, defined in the rules as lacking staff or facilities. And since th there was no showing that they lacked those things, it was improper for Queens to issue a diversionary instruction. Whether that was a diversionary instruction is a debatable point, okay? The court said that the regulation tells us that if the ambulance personnel contact the hospital and inform them that they wanna bring the individual to the hospital for treatment, the hospital may not deny the individual access unless it is in diversionary status. And here Queens has not contended that they were in diversionary status at the time they diverted Mr. Arrington to a more distant hospital. So the court does accept uh, for purposes of evaluating the motion to dismiss that what, Mr., or what Dr. Wong said was a diversionary instruction. We always use this case as a lesson for EMS practitioners to clarify vague and unclear medical command instructions. I think it'll be okay to you go to triplet. The next thing out of the paramedic's mouth could have well been, I'm sorry, Dr. Wong, are you saying that Queens is on diversionary status? No, see you in five minutes, right? Because that statement was somewhat vague. Nah, not somewhat, let's not be legal about it quite vague and indeterminate, okay? And since diversionary status is resource-based, it really was improper for anyone at that facility to pick up a radio and say, yeah, go somewhere else, because that order can only be given when it is a resource-based diversion, right? Diversionary status. And systems would do well to have specific criteria in place uh, and then apply informed decision-making with the patient to ensure that they go to the right destination. Okay, finally, let me finish off with the, and I'm checking the time here, I wanna make sure we don't run long and that I leave a few minutes for questions, but let me last but not least talk about the CMS interpretive guidance, which even more specifically drills down on these issues between hospitals and EMS and the handoff of patient care. This comes from some EMTALA guidance that was uh, sort of codified, if you want to call that, in this document, the citation of which you see here. Hospitals that deliberately delay moving an individual from an EMS stretcher to a hospital bed do not thereby delay the point in time at which their EMTALA obligation begins. And furthermore, the practice of, quote, parking patients arriving via EMS and refusing to release the EMS crew or equipment jeopardizes patient health and adversely impacts the ability of the EMS personnel to provide services to the rest of the community. So when this guidance first came out in the early 2000s, I know we at PWW and certainly others urged every EMS practitioner to print a copy of this out, fold it and stick it in the pants of their uniform duty, their, you know, their, their, their pants, right? Their uniform pants with big pockets on them. And of course, for a few years, a lot of EMS providers would roll into the emergency department. Staff would say, we're not, we're not ready. You, got, you have to wait here. We can't accept your patient. Pull it out of the pocket of their pants and go, see this, right? So not long after that, CMS uh, backpedaled a little bit, which we'll get to. But they also said that that practice of parking patients with EMS could be found to be a violation of the hospital's Medicare conditions of participation, which is uh, the ability of CMS to revoke their Medicare status. So about a year after that, they wrote this, after a lot of EMS providers waived that memo and a lot of hospital staff faces. On the other hand, said our government, this does not mean that a hospital will have necessarily violated EMTALA 
If it does not, in every instance, immediately assume from the EMS provider all responsibility for the care of the patient. For instance, there may be situations where a hospital does not have the capacity at the time the individual presents to perform an immediate medical screening examination. So if the EMS provider brought the person to an ED at a time when the staff was busy, it could be reasonable under those circumstances for the hospital to ask, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I did intentionally bold, italicize, underline, and change the font, co font color of that word, okay? The EMS provider to stay with the individual until such time as there was ED staff available to care for that individual. So the last sort of thing of note in this guidance is uh, the hospital still has a continuing duty to assess the patient and re-triage them if their condition is such that the folks that they've asked to provide that care, the EMS crew, uh, can't adequately take care of what that patient needs um, and take over that care immediately if the patient condition requires it. So let's now apply all that we have just learned to the two issues of diversion and uh, hospital bed delays. EMTALA specifically limits the circumstances and the reasons for which hospitals can declare diversionary status. So the kinds of instructions or orders that we saw Dr. Wong give in the Arrington case really should not be given. That would be a per se EMTALA violation if the hospital is even issuing a diversionary instruction for any reason other than unavailability of resources, okay? Secondly, EMTALA also specifically contemplates the situation in which an ambulance proceeds to the hospital despite that declaration of diversionary status. And we have heard reports all across the country, and some of you may have experienced situations where you bring a patient to an emergency department when diversionary status has been declared, and someone from the ER comes out and says, we told you not to come here. We're gonna file a complaint about this with the EMS office. <clears throat> and I always say, wait patiently till they make their phone call, ask if you can then borrow their phone and call the federal government for the EMTALA violation they just committed, okay? So again, remember that the physical presence of the patient on the hospital's property supersedes the diversionary request. The other thing I always make it a point to tell EMS and healthcare audiences is, yes, the regulation says this very clearly, but just because you heard a lawyer say, I have the right to be here in the emergency department, it doesn't always mean that it is the best thing clinically for a patient. If that Pay, that facility is truly lacking in the capability to take care of a patient. And I've got a patient who needs immediate care in an emergency department. My dialogue with the patient shouldn't be, heck with it, let's go there anyway, because we have that right. It should be, sir or ma'am, your condition is such that that hospital is experiencing treatment delays and we don't believe that your condition would be well served by going there. And they're giving us advice to go to another hospital and we think that's the best thing to do for your condition. So we still have tort duties. And that's another important thing to mention. We can talk all day if we want, mercifully for you, we will not talk all day about this, but about when the hospital's legal duty of care arises. And, and Tala makes that very clear. But that doesn't mean that EMS still doesn't have its tort duties of care to the patient. I didn't talk much about this, but you saw that the EMS crew in the Arrington case was also named as defendants. And their agency, the city and county of Honolulu, a non-hospital owned ambulance, did pay a settlement in the Arrington case under the theory that that decision to go to a different facility was negligent. Good old fashioned negligence, right? So we still have our tort duties of care and we cannot forget about those. And that's why we're all in this business anyway, right? To provide patient care. So the hospital's duties under EMTALA 
apply uh, when the patient arrives in the, in the ambulance on the hospital's property, regardless of the previous declaration of, of diversionary status. That means that these diversionary orders are in reality requests, but requests that ambulance practitioners, EMS providers, should you know, take into consideration in the whole picture of decision-making uh, by the patient. Now, the issue of APOT, ambulance patient offload times, when hospital staff say that you have to wait with the patient until we physically accept care, remember the hospital's federal legal duty arose when we got to their property. In fact, it arose when we got within 250 yards of their property, as we now know. So we also saw the word that I so carefully highlighted, ask, right? Hospitals can ask EMS practitioners to stay with patients, but make no mistake, the legal handoff of care occurs upon arrival on the hospital's property, even if the physical transfer of that care hasn't yet happened. So folks, statistically, does anybody have a wild guess what percentage of EMS patients require advanced level ALS level interventions? Anybody know what that number is? Anyone? 30 and five. Well, it's between that. So we're, we're, we're framing it. It's about 7.6%. So statistically, the vast majority of the patients that EMS brings to a hospital do not require ongoing continuous care by that EMS crew. And lest anybody raise the argument that it is abandonment for the EMS crew to leave that patient in the hospital when they are low acuity, it's not. When a patient presents on their own to an emergency department and they're told to sit in a waiting room, does the hospital provide a clinical staff member to sit with them? That was rhetorical, of course, but the answer is no, right? So. Where this idea arose that EMS commits abandonment if they don't stay with a low acuity patient the entire time until the physical transfer of care occurs is beyond me, right? So we I think it's important to distinguish this idea of the physical transfer of care with the, the legal transfer of care. Remember our tort duties, however, and again, just because you heard a lawyer say that staying with a patient in a hospital is voluntary, if they are one of the small percentage who do require continuous active care or monitoring, our tort duty of care probably tells us it's not a good idea to turn around and walk away. But again, statistically, we know that is a small number of our patient population, okay? And we already mentioned that. We suggest that EMS agencies put policies into place that make it clear what they will do when they bring patients into hospital emergency departments. And that policy should allow for those kinds of exceptions like patients undergoing active resuscitation, patients who are unstable, patients who are an active threat to themselves or others, for example, patients in active labor, of course. But again, because statistically that universe of patients is small, that policy should be recognizing of those uh, likely tort duties to provide continuing care in that small number of cases where it is necessary. But for the other 90%, I can't think of a federal MTALA duty because it doesn't apply to most ambulances or a tort duty to have to remain with a low acuity patient for indefinite periods of time just because the hospital says so, right? So EMS systems can sort of take their own deployment back into their hands by, you know, properly understanding their legal requirements and the hospitals properly understanding their legal obligations. Okay, few minutes left for some Q&A. This usually does raise questions. Yes, sir. Good question. How does this affect urgent care centers or in some states freestanding emergency departments? Ready for the legal answer of the morning? Probably not the first time you'll hear it. It depends. And what it depends on is if the hospital elects what's called provider-based status for that freestanding entity. If it elects provider-based status, it is considered a hospital. If it does not elect provider-based status, it's a clinic. 
and it wouldn't apply. So, great question. Yes, ma'am. What a fantastic question. Is Imtala predicated on the fact that it applies only to transporting ambulances or can it apply to non-transporting units such as we have many of in Pennsylvania, like paramedic level intercept vehicles that don't transport but bring the paramedics and the equipment to the scene and then they sometimes jump on the ambulance and transport with the patient. Imtala does not speak to that. But however, it really does defer to state law on the definition of an ambulance. Pennsylvania, I believe, still includes those entities, Ken Brody, former counsel of the Pennsylvania Department of Health sitting right here, as ambulances, does it not? Oh, not anymore? It used to in the old act. Yeah. Okay. So I think under MTALA, it would look to state law for that determination. I am not yet aware of the case that has been brought on that point. But I think state law would probably supply the answer to it. My guess is if a hospital-owned, non-transporting ALS intercept arrived at a scene, that it's more likely than not that a court would find an MTALA obligation on the part of the hospital that owns that unit. That is merely my informed guess, but it's great. Great question, haven't seen that case yet. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Sorry, I, I want to make sure I understand the fact pattern here. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, if a hospital-owned ambulance transfers a patient from their hospital to another non-affiliated facility and then sort of leaves without a proper uh, handover, would that be an unauthorized transfer? I, I don't think it would be unauthorized as long as I had the consent of the patient or the responsible decision maker to do the transport, but I don't think that hospital-owned ambulance I mean, any ambulance that did that would be fulfilling their tort duties if they simply left a patient. I think at minimum, if the ambulance leaves a patient, they have an obligation to inform hospital staff of their presence, where the patient is, or at least where we left them, and then what is their condition at the time we left them. Doesn't mean I have to hand them a full, complete patient care report, but I should give them at least the necessary clinical information to facilitate a transfer of care. So... Interesting question. Uh, other questions we have, let's see, one minute left. Any, any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you so much for your kind attention on that one. We now have a 10 minute break and then we will get our legislative panel in place. And boy, is there a lot to talk about legislatively in Pennsylvania. So see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Been a while since I trotted that one out. Okay, folks, it's about that time. We're going to go ahead and get started again with our distinguished panel that we have here who have joined us in prior years, and we very much appreciate the support of these individuals and organizations of uh, the Widener Commonwealth Law EMS Symposium. So starting on this end, we have Heather Sherrar, who is the Executive Director of the Ambulance Association of Pennsylvania, uh, and who has been for how many years now, Heather? Uh, 17 in January. Holy cow, 17 years. So there's a few of us here, according, including former president of the Pennsylvania Ambulance Association, uh, and some of us who have been around that organization for several decades, um, not looking at any particular dinosaurs. But, um, and I think I can speak for those folks who would say that without a doubt, under Heather's uh, guidance, the uh, Ambulance Association has never uh, been as effective 
as it has been under under her leadership and the amount of uh, productive legislation to benefit our our profession. Um, so we're really looking forward to what Heather has to say. Next, we have uh, Jerome or Jerry Ozog, who is the executive director uh, of the Pennsylvania Fire and Emergency Services Institute, uh, without whose personal intervention, I can tell you that some of the laws now we're going to talk about here uh, would not have happened. Uh, Jerry is uh, an active uh, firefighter, uh, paramedic. No, not a paramedic anymore, but no, okay. Volunteer firefighter. Uh, and has been around the system uh, for, sorry, Jerry, but decades. So somebody we've known a long time. Uh, over here, we are uh, very thrilled to have uh, returning with us uh, first closest to me is uh, Nate Silcox, Nathan Silcox, who is the executive director of the Veterans Affairs uh, and Emergency Preparedness Committee for the Senate of Pennsylvania, who has, uh, we were just discussing, a perfect attendance record at this symposium every year. And then uh, next to Nate is Sean Harris, the executive director, uh, and congratulations on that. That's, that's a new, uh, new promotion, yes? Yes. Uh, of the House Veterans Affairs uh, and Emergency Preparedness Committee. So first off, please uh, join us in welcoming uh, these individuals to our panel. And last thing I'll say, and then I'll let these experts talk, is that uh, having worked closely with both of these gentlemen on some legislation, uh, I can tell you that their personal involvement in shepherding things through the General Assembly that benefit our profession is, is really unequaled. And uh, our, our whole profession owes these, these two a, a huge debt of gratitude as well as these two. So why don't we start with Heather if we could, and uh, I'll surrender the podium unless you'd like to sit at your, but maybe for the cameras and everything else, if you wanna use the podium, whatever it's all works. yours. Yeah, okay, works. Heather Sharar. Good morning, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, yes. Well, I actually have some good news. Usually it's like, we have to do this. We have to do this. We need to do this. So we're at the end of a session. And in my almost 17 years, this was the most successful session that I have ever experienced. So starting with um, just some of the successes that we've had, Act 1A of 2021 um, directed some ARPA funds to the MSOF fund. And that is the fund that actually goes to um, some of the bureaucracy, if you will, of EMS. It didn't actually go directly to the providers. Act 21 of 2021, which was House Bill 1854, 854, temporarily regulatory flexibility authority, and it was basically extending the COVID waivers for staffing. Act 10 of 2022, which was the $25 million in ARPA funds that went directly to EMS agencies, which was wonderful. And everybody got about $37,000 for um, those who did apply. Act 45 of 2022, which was Senate Bill 861, which Nate was very involved in, Doug Wolfberg was very involved in, and that was the EMS compact. So if we ever get into a situation with COVID again, and we need to bring in other EMS compact states that have providers that can come into Pennsylvania and help us out, they can, which was great. And we can actually go there as well. Act 60 of 2022, which is called Titan's Law, which is canine care, which provides civil immunity to EMS providers who provide care to canines, to dogs, to horses that are in, um, in service. Act 72 of 2022, which is the BLS minimum staffing waiver, extends the minimum staffing waiver past the COVID waiver. Um, it goes until April of 2027 so that you can use an EMS vehicle operator and a um, EMS provider above the level of, e or at or above the level of EMT. Um, and that goes until 2027. Act 74 of 2022, which was the fireworks law, which um, gave us $1.5 million to the grant program, $250,000 for online training, a million dollars to the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency, a million dollars to the Department of Health for the purposes of training EMS personnel, $500,000 to the Office of the State Fire Commissioner for the purpose of providing emergency services training center capital grants, $500,000 to the Office of State Fire Commissioner for the purpose of providing career fire department capital grants. And if you're gonna, I don't know if you're gonna talk about that at all. 
Um, and then any remaining money shall be equally divided and transferred. 50% goes in accordance with paragraph one, and there's some, some other things. Act 104 of 2022, which is House Bill 397, actually codified those disbursements. So that actually passed, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Act 135 of 2022, which is House Bill 2527, it changes the Good Samaritan law, adding an opioid antagonist instead of just solely naloxone under the section of controlled substance drugs. Act 146 of 2022, which is Senate Bill 225, and it's known as the Reform of Prior Authorization. And this bill, we were not told about. Um, there was a group of providers, hospitals, emergency physicians, and some others that had actually been working on this bill for six years with some of the staff from the insurance committee. And even though it described emergency services, they didn't take us into consideration. And there was some language in there that would have been very detrimental to EMS. So what we did, what we were able to change was we changed the definition of EMS in the insurance law. And so it is changed to emergency transportation or related emergency service provided by licensed ambulance service. And um, the reason why that was important is because treat no transport that passed a couple of years ago, the insurance company law still said emergency and, or emergency or and treatment, sorry. It's the ands and the ors, and Ken can go into statutory construction, which I'm sure you all know. Um, so because it is transportation without, or treatment without transportation, that or became very important. So that was good news. The definition of healthcare provider was changed to add EMS. And then we were actually exempted from notifying the insurers within 10 days of treatment. And that's important for us because we don't always know in an emergent situation who the insurer is. And if a transport takes place over the weekend, if billing staff has to get it on a Monday and then they have to find out who the insurer is, we may be extended past that 10 days. So we were actually exempted from that. And there was a lot of discussion back and forth with the group. It is the Pennsylvania Patient Advocacy Group. And there's a lot of advocacy groups out there, but we are now a part of that. They've invited us to continue to join them. So we'll be able to have some discussions with them from this point forward. So if you look at financially, which is very important to EMS, and I see all the EMS providers sitting here, which we had a really good year. So Act 10 gave us $25 million. Act 54, which is the medical assistance increase, we estimate to be about $52 million. 17 million of that will be the state portion and then the rest will be the federal portion. And um, luckily for us, this takes effect January 1st. DHS just issued a bulletin that had the increases except for ALS2 and SCT. It's still listed at the $300 rate instead of 400. So we'll be talking to them about that. The fireworks law with the taxis leveled, a levy towards EMS, it's one and a half million for the grant program, $1 million towards tuition assistance, and $1 million for training of EMS personnel. And that totals 86,360,000. So that's huge, absolutely huge. So effective January 1st, um, medical assistance will be 325 for the BLS rate, 400 for the ALS rate, caveat being ALS2 and SCT, which we will work on. And then the mileage is $4 per loaded miles after the first 20. And we can talk about the future, but anyway, that's on our agenda. I will not jump ahead, but do you want, well, that's for next session. So this is just the successes that we've had so far. Okay. Yeah, so it was, a good, it was a good two years. And Thanks to Nate and Sean for always working with us and for Jerry and all the members who actually reached out every time we sent out to a call, a call to action. It does make a difference. It really does make a difference. Thank you. Well, we certainly wanna get through these updates, but I, I, I think we're gonna have a few minutes because we do wanna hear about future initiatives and what, what remains to be done. Cause I think a lot of these folks are here to polish up their crystal ball too. So, um, just to keep uh, people on schedule, Sean, would you like to go next? And you, again, feel free to do it from there or from here at the podium. It's all yours, whichever you would like. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. As you know, my name is Sean Harris, and I took over for former executive director Rick O'Leary, uh, who retired after more than 29 years in uh, the House. Uh, I've been with the House for 20 and on the committee for 17. Um, because I may have to leave early because there is a bill moving today that I'm responsible for, so I may have to leave early. Uh, so what I just want to say is you heard some of the successes we've had. Uh, I'm going to let Nate cover some things uh, that we're looking forward to. I just want to cut my time short because I've done many fire and EMS seminars throughout the Commonwealth for the past 17 years. So I've learned one thing. What most people want in the audience is Q&A. They don't want to hear me sit, stand up here and tell you everything. You want to ask questions. You want to know what's going on. So I'd rather get to that portion so Nate and I can at least assist with that. But uh, I look forward to working with the EMS community going forward for the next um, years. Um, and <laughs> but anyway, you'll be seeing me around, and uh, you know us and um, the association. So uh, if you need my card, let me know. I'll share that with you. But I think most of you may know who I am, so that's not a big deal. But again, thank you for having me here, and uh, I look forward to returning in the future and working with everyone. Thank you. That was brief. Nate, would you like to give an update next? Thank you. Thank you, Doug, and, and thank you for uh, holding, continuing to hold this series. I think this uh, symposium is, is uh, excellent. Um, it, get, it brings us together. It's, it's perfectly timed here uh, towards the end of this uh, year. Uh, so it's a you know, perfect opportunity to have a, an end of session wrap up. Sorry, my voice is a little sore today. I, I was uh, screaming at the TV last night at a couple of refs. Uh, for the football game, so I apologize for that. Uh, didn't didn't help us out at all, but nonetheless, uh, no, it's it's been a very productive session, as as Heather and um, and and Sean both mentioned here. And you know, it's it's thanks to everybody working together. Um, you know, let me start off. You know, uh, my senator chairs the committee, Senator Pat Stefano. He's from Fett County. Um, took on the committee here during the 21-22 session. Uh, he was very interested in, in these issues. He was very involved locally, uh, you know, with his fire companies, his EMS providers, and uh, was tuned into a, a number of these issues. And, uh, you know, so from that angle, it helped. And from us working together, you know, and, and getting the EMS community and also the fire community speaking with one voice uh, helps, you know, immensely, you know, to make sure that your priorities are indeed everybody's priorities. And so uh, the EMS community, uh, you know, particularly this year in 2022, uh, you know, spoke together, spoke clearly uh, on some issues. And in June, you know, uh, right before June, we had Senate Bill 739. That's the, uh, you know, the $25 million that went towards, uh, you know, um, for the uh, EMS community, I believe about $39,000, $37,000 each agency got, you know, that was a huge shot in the arm. And then come June, uh, we got together, we had a press conference, we had the, the four chairs of the committee to, uh, together, we had uh, the EMS community to speak together, and we focused on a couple main things at that point, you know, one being my boss's uh, Senate Bill 861, that was the EMS compact, we also talked about House Bill 20, 29, 2097, uh, the EMS waiver legislation, uh, and we also we talked about a couple other uh, ancillary issues, uh, and we also talked about the rates, the reimbursement rates, and all three of those issues got done, uh, you know, during that June timeframe. And then we had a bonus with uh, Representative Frank Ferry, who's a fire chief locally. He spearheaded the, the repurposing of the fireworks uh, revenues. And that, that got done as well during that June timeframe. And then we reassembled, uh, thanks to Jerry putting together another working group. We, you know, we got together and we started talking again for what's, what's our plan here for the fall. And it was, um, codifying the, the fireworks legislation. And, you know, thankfully we were able to get, get it done within House Bill 30, 397. It's an omnibus measure. It contains 12 different provisions in there and it passed unanimously in the end. So I'm very uh, pleased that we were able to get all of this done, you know, plus what happened in 2021 and, you know, and as well as last session, Act 91 uh, did, did quite a bit for the fire and EMS community as well. And a number of those provisions now need to uh, be implemented. So we're looking forward to seeing both the fire commissioner's office as well as the Bureau of EMS implement a number of these measures uh, in the ensuing session. So 
again, it was a very productive session. Look forward to work, continuing to work with, um, with all of our colleagues here. And thank you for everything you do in the EMS world. So thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. Okay, and our last, but certainly not least, presentation before we get into panel questions is Jerry Ozog. Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, again, uh, I will uh, concur with uh, all the previous speakers in the success that we have had over the past two years. I, I, I want to say that the interest in EMS and fire is, is really, really important. That, that came along from uh, SR6. One of the first things that we had is the House Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness Committee had a orientation hearing on EMS issues of the future. And I don't remember what month that was, if that was uh, uh, March or April of this year. And we had EMS providers from across the state, EMS managers testify at that hearing. And there was, uh, it was very clear, very articulate, especially a, a gentleman from Harleysville, Pennsylvania, that talked about his, um, you know, his billing and his donations and his membership program gets him to about 64% of his budget. And his goal was to figure out new ways to engage the municipalities to help fund his EMS operation. There was also hearings for the future of fire, yeah, it, talking about different things. There was hearings, the, the House uh, Republican Policy Committee has had several hearings across Pennsylvania where there is engagement of EMS. Uh, there's engagement of fire. There is definitely an interest and a continued interest. And that is because of the things all of you do to help cooperate with what we do. Uh, searching for solutions for the future. Uh, the, again, there'll be a discussion after we are completed on the Municipal Authorities Act. However, one of the things that came out of the House um, the, the House hearing, House Veterans and Affairs uh, Committee hearing was uh, House Bill 2601. And uh, I know Sean was probably involved in writing that. That was not passed this session, but, but it is okay. So in Pennsylvania, EMS agencies can engage their municipalities and ask for a 0.5 mil EMS tax. And uh, 2601, working with some of the municipal associations would allow uh, that to be raised to a, a 1.5 uh, mil increase. Again, fire service in Pennsylvania is allowed to go to a three mil with your municipalities. So uh, anything above a 0.5 mil, EMS and the local municipalities has to do a referendum. So part of my responsibility is to track what happens across Pennsylvania. And, and this year, there have been two successful local organizations that have went to their voters to ask for additional funding for EMS. And the first is in Newtown Township in Bucks County. And what uh, Newtown EMS, Newtown Ambulance Squad did is engage their community, engage their elected officials, and they were able to successfully put on, uh, on the ballot a, uh, uh, an increase above the, uh, uh, the 0.5 mils for EMS. And, and 50 uh, of the people that voted, 57.8 uh, 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 supported it, uh, which was a good thing. The second thing is, is in Elwood City, Pennsylvania, which is in, uh, in uh, Mercer County, uh, Elwood City uh, had a, uh, a voters pass an ALS referendum so they could add ALS to the fire department. And it passed in that community, the referendum passed 1,800 to 700. Okay, so why, why did I want to mention those two examples? Those two examples are something where local EMS is engaging their elected officials they are, and the community, and they're effectively telling the story on what's going on and how to seek additional funding for ongoing sustainability. It's our goal, working with our associations, working with our partners in the House and Senate, to come up with ideas to help come up with legislation to make sure that we can ensure that an ambulance shows up in a reasonable amount of time in Pennsylvania. We are very well aware of what's happening in rural parts of Pennsylvania. We're getting reports on a, on a weekly basis of things. So this is some of the priorities. Uh, even though we were not able to get uh, House Bill 2601 moved this time, we still need to come up with those types of innovative solutions and engagement at the local level, uh, at the county level, and at the state level. So I'm all up for questions and answers too. So we'll uh, we'll be able to move on to that.
Okay, thank you, Jerry. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists for the updates. I think you all have your mics on the tables. So I think what we'll do is start to field some questions. But the first one I'm, I'm gonna ask to tee us off and that is uh, we need to know what's happening with the political landscape. Uh, of course, there are still some uh, races undetermined from the last election. And um, can uh, uh, Sean and Nate, can you guys uh, give us an update on what's happening with, uh, with the General Assembly in terms of the, the election? You start with I'll start it off. It's a little easier in the Senate. So the Senate will remain um, <clears throat> relatively unchanged in terms of the the, the composition between the Republicans and Democrats, Republicans will, will will remain in the majority. And actually today is our leadership elections for the 2023-24 uh, session. So a number of the offices from President Pro Tem to Appropriations Chair will all be decided uh, this afternoon. So once, you know, that's, that's helpful for us to, uh, uh, to know going forward. A lot of the questions rest upon who's in leadership. Um, and then the, the next question in terms of the chair of, of this committee will uh, come about most likely in the um, early January uh, portion when we reconvene, get sworn in. So, you know, a lot of it's gonna be hurry up and wait, uh, but at least in terms of our end, uh, leadership elections today, and then wait till January to uh, reconvene and, and committee chairmanships will be announced at that point. Are there any, uh, is there any inside baseball stuff, any inside track uh, candidates for, for particularly the committee ship, or is that still is that kind of a wide open thing depending on leadership it, it really is uh you know it, it depends upon the interests of members where you know where they lie and you know uh, certainly senator stefano has enjoyed serving on this committee it's been a very again a very productive uh term and uh he was just on, on uh, interviewed on pcn last night uh you know extolling you know a lot of the same uh issues that that got passed here so he's enjoyed it as to what but uh obviously he can't commit yet to uh, because again, he doesn't make that decision in, uh, by himself. Looking sure. forward to it, though. Thank you, Sean. Uh, what would you like to add? Well, I could speak to my side. Uh, unfortunately, my side is a little uh, up in the air right now. We are looking at a a razor thin minority majority split, hovering around 102, and that's what you need to pass a bill uh, with a simple majority. As of right now, there. My understanding is there are two races that are yet to be called. If they were to go to the Republican side, that would be 102. The Democrat side would be 102 to their favor, or 103, possibly. Um, having said that, regardless of what happens, whether that's decided or there's maybe some uh, court challenges, uh, uh, automatic recounts, whatever that may be, we don't know where we're at. Regardless, I'm still left with two new chairmen coming in, whether it's on the minority side or majority side, whoever has which. Um, I don't know who they are going to be. I have an idea who they can be. That doesn't matter. That doesn't mean anything as far as I'm concerned. Um, there were 40, there are more than 44 vacancies in the house this go around. So you're talking many, many new freshmen coming in. So that's gonna uh, change the dynamics of who will be the rank and file members of the committees. Uh, that could change the current makeup of the committee that I have now on both sides. On my side, Republican side, there's four vacancies. And there is one on a Democrat side. So when it comes time to choose A, our leadership, which may take a little while, that's been delayed by a week. And then once that takes place, then the leadership needs to get together and we got to come back in January and form the committee on committee. So we'll then decide who the rank and file members are going to be on each committee. So having said that, depending on where the final results come down, can shift the time frame in which all these decisions are made. So that's where we're at, but I can tell you this much. In terms of the committee, as long as I'm there, I'm gonna to continue to work uh, for EMS to uh, continue the work that we have started with SR6, uh, build on the successes we've had these past two years, whether I'm in a minority or majority. And again, my committee has always been nonpartisan, so that should not be an issue. And I will work with Nate to make uh, make things easier for my side. But again, I'm going to continue to do what I've done for the past 17 years and continue to do what Rick O'Leary started 29 years ago. And that is to work to better the EMS community in the Commonwealth. Doug, let me let me uh, sure. piggyback off that as well. I mean, again, as, as Sean said, we work very well together. Uh, you know, with our colleagues on, on both sides of the aisle and, and just about everything that we, we've done this session, 
maybe short of the emergency declaration issue, uh, which is a little bit more partisan, but the EMS issues, the fire issues, military and veterans uh, issues have all been worked um, across the aisle and uh, broad support, if not unanimous support. So it's it's been a joy, you know, working on this committee and and uh, across the aisle on both sides. So I have no doubt that we'll be able to get some good things done um, in the ensuing session. Thank you. And that was something I wanted to follow up now that both of you have said that, that you know, when we talk about horse races and majority and minority and if a chamber flips and committee chairs change, it seems like a lot of the issues of concern to the folks here really do transcend those horse races. Would, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I, without certainly not asking for any kind of data on this, but would you have sort of even an anecdotal or a gut feel of what percentage of the bills that Heather and Jerry have talked about and that you guys have mentioned do for EMS and public safety do pass with with bipartisan support. Would you say the majority of those bills pass with bipartisan support? Yeah. Yes. And I could speak to to uh, my side. Um, we've always tried to put forward legislation that we know a is going to address a systemic issue and B, we can garner the support needed to not just get it out of committee, but to get it to the next chamber and onto the governor's desk. Uh, so to answer your question, it, it's we're, we're more narrowed in our approach rather than just throwing stuff out there, hoping it sticks. And, you know, you also, Sean just mentioned the governor as well. So the, you know, uh, it's, we've had a Democrat governor for, for the past eight years. We'll have a uh, Democrat governor for at least the next four years. So, you know, ultimately, you know, you need to be, you know, a lot of this is wonderful, you know, passing a bill amongst the chamber, you know, but my ultimate goal is to get it across the goal line and, and you know, get a governor's signature. That's, you know, that's when you've uh, gotten something done for, uh, for, for the folks in this room. So that's, that's the ultimate goal. And, and Nate, thank you. Cause that's an, another important piece of bipartisanship. If, if we have sponsors of one party and a governor of a different party, right. We, we have, these issues have to transcend the political divide, or we won't be able to expect a governor or be able to ask a governor to sign those. So that that's an important point that a lot of these issues are nonpartisan, which ties in with the next thing I was going to ask. And that is that one of, it seems to me, you guys are the experts, but you're me the members on these committees and the members at large in both chambers do need to hear from the folks across the state, right? I mean, that, you know, we don't, they, they don't just conjure up bills. They, they, they pass laws that people need and want and, and ask them for. So can you talk just for a minute about the role that everyone here can play in that process by communicating with their uh, local legislative officials? Um, yes, that's a great question. And then that speaks to education and realizing that those of you who are sitting in this room and the provider community, you are a constituent of a member in the House or the Senate. Uh, you're no different than anybody else. And one of the things you need to do in my mind is two things. One is you need to let them know you're there, why you exist, what it is you do. And that leads to the second point is to educate them. You got to educate the members. Like I said earlier, there's more than 44 people coming in who are new that are going to be placed on committees. And those who are um, that are assigned to my committee, it's going to be an education process on my part to help them to understand who the stakeholders are who the providers are, what it is, they, what their needs are, and what their needs have been that we've been trying to address for years. Uh, so to your question, um, it's an education. That's that's what it's going to take, an education. And one of the things that we have done, and, and, and Nate and I have discussed doing this, is to give the members and the stakeholders a chance to come before the committee during in the spring, when we uh, get up and running, to come and tell the members who are sitting on the committee what are your issues? And you have a chance like here, Q&A, where the members can ask questions of the EMS community and the fire community as well, uh, so that they, they get over that learning curve. And then they can then take it to the floor to the rest of the members and say, here is what our issues are, because I heard from my constituents. And then when it comes to you folks, when you talk to the members out there who are not on the committee, and they hear from those who are on the committee, you say, oh, yeah, I know that. You're right. And, and that's how you need to build consensus among the folks out there. Nate? Yeah, look, there, there's multiple ways to get a bill across the goal line or, or get an initiative out there. You know, the most important part, a lot of these issues here today that, you know, that, that we trumpeted, you know, you know, have dollars uh, associated with them. And anything for a big ticket item like that, you know, really requires, again, 
uh, the EMS community to speak with one voice. And that's, you know, that's through the Ambulance Association um, and, and, you know, Jerry's group with the, the Fire and Emergency Services Institute, you know, and that's what, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, get that conversation, keep these conversations going so that, you know, the various groups out there are speaking with one voice in terms of the fire community and as well as with the EMS community. So that's, that's huge. Uh, if, you know, the, the organizations at large are, are on the same page. And then, you know, obviously that needs to, to be communicated to uh, the membership at the local level that when you speak with your, your local house member or your local senator, uh, that you're also communicating that, that same, uh, those same talking points, so to speak. You're certainly, look, uh, we all have our own individual issues uh, to bring to the attention of our, our members, and that's important too. And some of those issues can get done on their own, but in terms of the, the, the large items, it really requires working together and speaking with that one voice. And, you know, another aspect, you know, uh, you know, a couple of these issues, you know, the EMS compact came about, you know, as a result of some of this, you know, a couple of years ago from discussions in this room. So we're pleased that, uh, you know, that's gotten to the goal line, looking forward to seeing it implemented. Um, also the countywide authorities, there's going to be some further discussion today, but, you know, a couple of years ago, some folks in this room were like, well, what's the, what, what are you doing big? What outside the box? And a couple of these uh, items have, have come out, you know, from even in this room. So appreciate uh, the continued discussions. Absolutely. And I'm going to turn it open to the group here for some Q&A, but I want to slip one more in. And that is that when you talk about the engagement of folks with their local elected officials, um, can you talk a little bit about meeting them for the first time when the building's on fire, right? When something bad is happening and, you know, having the, the merit of having that pre-existing relationship so they know who you are and you're not always the person who just comes knocking when, you know, when when things are, are bad or something, you know, big is going down. Can you talk about that just for a second? Yeah, it's it's important for you to, number one, be involved with, with the associations. Uh, you know, it, you know, we'll have, you know, events from time to time. And look, we look for, you know, an ambulance or, or, or a fire truck as a backdrop and, and they, they provide added value to the whole thing. Um, you know, certainly getting into the halls and in, in, in terms of the, um, the capital is important, but locally it's, it's very important for you to have uh, uh, contact with your house member, your, your Senator, and you know, not just at the end of the game, Hey, we, you know, you know, the, the sky is falling, we need this uh, yesterday, or we need to stop this or something like that. But if you have, you know, invite uh, your members uh, to, your, you know, to an event that you're holding, you know, and, you know, just because it, they didn't attend one time, uh, you know, continue to do it, or if they haven't been there in years, or if you have a new member, certainly the new members are, are huge to make sure that they're, uh, they're tuned into your needs, even if you didn't support them uh, uh, during their, uh, the, during their election, get to know them, see what you can do to work with them on that front, it's huge. Whether it's returning members, new members coming in, last thing you want a member to say when it comes to your issues and concerns is, well, I didn't know, I wasn't aware. That is what you don't want to happen. So you need to make them aware. Invite them out to uh, the station, let them sit there and see what it's like to sit there and wait for the 911 call to go off. That's a big one. That, that education right there, realizing that the only way you survive is hoping that somebody has their worst day in their life Think about that. They have to have the worst day in their life for you to survive. So they need, they need to understand that. Come sit with us for a couple hours to see what it takes and then go out for a ride. That's the education factor. So they understand what it takes to provide this service 24 7 365. And I'm sure Heather and Jerry will have their work cut out educating new, new members. So let me open it up to the, uh, the audience here. And we are going to come back. I'm going to ask you guys to talk about future initiatives. But let's give folks here a chance to ask questions of any of our panelists. So uh, open it up. Who is, who's, got, who's got a question? Yes, sir. Let me repeat it real quickly for, for, the, uh, for the audio. How do we keep the success going that we've had? How do we keep the fire going was the question. Who wants to? I'll start off. I'm, uh, I'll Heather, start. Heather, yes. so go ahead. <laughs> so you need, you need to, first of all, you need to know who your legislator is. You need to reach out to them. And I always use this as example, you know, don't just reach out to them and tell them that you have a problem. Wish them a happy birthday, just to wish them a happy birthday because they're people too. They don't always understand what the issues are. So if you can talk to them or say, you know, if you look on the AAP website and there's a piece of legislation and you're like, hey, what's this? Just 
send me an email or call me and we can talk about it. And then if you wanna to talk to your legislator, you can do that. But we really recommend a, a regular relationship with your legislator because they are people as well. So to keep that momentum going, because there are new people, there are, there's, there's a lot of education that has to be done because and, you know, in their mind, they call 911, they get an ambulance, what's the issue? Very interesting. The uh, one thing that I do want to recommend is don't use acronyms when you talk. We do, we do, we do a great job, ALS, BLS, NREMTP and things, you know, again, understanding from their perspective on what, uh, you know, you know, we do a lot of, a lot of talk and acronyms. So break that down into common sense, uh, you know, very open, open to me is, you know, we were meeting with uh, someone from the house and Senate, we were or from the house and we were talking about, uh, you know, you know, these some of these big picture items and and what what was brought up in in the meeting was um you know they got a, a concern from a constituent uh and they received two ambulance bills and the whole focus of the, the conversation that's what the member was concerned about was two ambulance bills but we were there for something completely different and understanding and explaining that process kind of derailed the original conversation but uh, you know, that's those type of things that happen and, and going through there real quick on the, on the, how do we keep it going is, you know, we are attempting to develop statewide strategies, uh, listening, conducting town hall meetings, what is out there, and then trying to seek innovative ways to move forward. Again, uh, listening to what works. We know that, you know, there is some ways to come out there, but uh, come out and come up with some solutions, but that, Keeping EMS, um, keeping EMS at the forefront, uh, continually understanding, and if there is concerns about response times, lack of EMS resources, those type of things, that need, you need to be as proactive as possible to talk about that and have honest uh, and transparent discussions. Thank you. How about our legislative directors here on that question? Anything to else to add? Again, there's been some uh, a lot of good things happened uh, over the course of these last two years, it, it, you know, even prior to that. Um, and it's not by happenstance. Um, you know, the regular meetings amongst the associations uh, have been have been very helpful. And, you know, the SR6, you know, um, you know it happened in 2018, you know, put forth uh, uh, the 27 recommendations, broad recommendations over on and there. But we've we've had a working group that's continued to meet, you know, and, you know, continuing years, it's not all based on just, you know, what was in SR6 itself, but, you know, it's, it's, it's evolved on that front. Uh, but having continually coming back and having those conversations, a lot of the same folks and some new folks as well, those things have happened. That's been very helpful to get us together in the room. And then, you know, getting together and, and you know, between Sean and I talking about what can be done from our end and what's, you know, what's on the wish list overall be able to put those together in, in terms of a, you know, concise package, you know, you can't go uh, and put forth that we're going to go ahead and, and pass 25 bills right off the bat. There's, you know, what are your, your main priorities? What are the top ones? And if you get the members, to, uh, your members to buy into that, and then you're be able to be a lot more effective when you're communicating that. John? I, I would just add that as we always want. As long as Nate and I are here, we'll have some successes because We've shown that already by working together in both chambers, uh, bringing both the House and the members together on the same issues. But I go back to what I said before, it's the education factor. If the members don't know what your issues are and what needs to be addressed in their own backyard, then it makes it, it, makes it that much tougher for us. But we are, are, we're gonna continue to, to build on what we did. And that's why we started SR6, to build on that. And we're gonna continue. You have your low hanging fruit, you have your mid hanging and high hanging. So. Uh, we, we achieved a lot. And I will say this though, Nate and I talked about this earlier before we started. Uh, we had our successes with the uh, fireworks tax. Now we need to see what happens with that, with the implementation of, and the rollout of uh, that funding uh, with the enabling legislation. But there's other areas that we can address. Um, and one of those areas ha happens to be uh, the, the funding that you need. You still need more funding. Still, re you're still relying on 70% of your revenue coming from both Medicaid and Medicare. So, how we get around that? That's one of our uh, obstacles right now. So, thank you. I, I, there's something else I want to point out because I think we you know we we see the legislative side and the association side. When when a constituent calls a member and asks for a solution or to introduce a piece of legislation, 
you guys can all speak to this, but these guys communicate with these guys, right? They want to see if there's broader support, if this is an extremely localized issue, or can we get these, particularly these two statewide organizations involved and supportive of that? I, I want to really make a plea here that for any EMS organization here or those watching, if you are not active and participating in one or both of these organizations, that is imperative because these organizations are the ones that these guys and their members look to for that kind of expertise and to ensure that they have widespread support throughout our, our, our profession statewide. And, you know, Heather talked about, what was your total, 80, uh, 82 or 86 80, million? 86, 360. 86. And what you didn't include was the $10 million foundation grant that the Ambulance oh, yeah, Association yeah. attracted due to that working relationship. So. Right. That's almost $100 million in one legislative session. Uh, every organization in the state benefits from that. So every organization should have the opportunity to help shape that agenda by being members of the organizations that quite literally are bringing that kind of relief uh, to, to organizations across the state. So uh, this is a, an urgent imperative that, that all EMS, fire, and public safety organizations in the state uh, become participants in these in these associations because the work they are doing, as you have heard, is number one monumental and number two, it is delivering incredible results that benefit the entire uh, EMS and public safety communities in Pennsylvania. So we got to talk about that. But anyway, okay, other questions from the audience. So while you're formulating your questions, I want to <laughs> ask Heather and Jerry, uh, to talk about what's next. And, you know, I, I can't imagine uh, being them and listen to a guy like me saying, oh, you just delivered $100 million. What are you going to do for us now? You know, because it, it, it doesn't stop, right? But, you know, you have goals and, and, and you know, what, what do we want to build on? So, um, Heather, do you want to start and, and tell sure. us what might be on the agenda for future looking successes? Sure. Um, okay. First and foremost, when it comes to medical assistance, that, that project's not done. Even though we did get a, an increase, we still have that 20 mile rule where they don't pay for the first 20 loaded miles. And of course the medical assistance policies go back to the eighties and they're very outdated. So we need to get those updated as well. Uh, we're talking about, of course, education, education, education when it comes to the legislators because they are new. And a lot of times they get phone calls and then they automatically introduce a piece of legislation and then Sean calls or Nate calls. And then of course we have to talk about that or um, two years ago, House Bill 1862, which I use this as an example all the time was the surprise balance billing that we were included in. And we were actually able to stop it because we worked with other organizations. So we'll continue to work with the Pennsylvania Provider Advocacy Coalition, the patient Advocacy Coalition, HAP, the Medical Society, a lot of other organizations, so that when it comes to our issues, that we can garner support, we would we are going to continue to do that. Um, we're looking at, we've investigated this last year, the GEMT, which, um, are you guys going to talk about that at all? Just a little bit? Okay. What it is, it is actually a provider assessment that you would actually pay into medical assistance and then draw back a greater amount. There are 11 other states that are doing this. We didn't see a whole lot of interest. We did do educational um, sessions all throughout the year. It is very complicated. We did just get a medical assistance increase that takes us up to about 80% of the Medicare, but we're still not done. We're um, investigating the potential of a fee statewide fee schedule. So that way you would be paid, um, hopefully more, across the board rather than it's this for commercials, it's this for Medicare, well, Medicare is different, but medical assistance. So could, to kind of even out that playing field. And then of course, funding, which Jerry talked about, which is the, the township and municipalities actually funding EMS, because it's different. If you look at the reimbursement end, that's for the service that you provide, but there's also a cost to readiness. And we've used that terminology for, for years. And to get the legislators to understand what that is and other organizations is important. Um, education, education, education. Yeah. <laughs> it will be the bills that, you know, that Nate and Sean get in touch with us about. It'll be ones that we see, that we hear about. 
do we have a position? We'll continue to reach out to staff. We've got a good relationship now with the transportation committee. The insurance committee is a little different. We've had a direct pay um, legislation that's been introduced every session and they've told us that it's going nowhere. So when you go up against the insurers and their millions of dollars in lobbying, it's a little difficult. We are public safety, of course. So got to balance that. So we don't have the millions of dollars for no, legislative the advocacy. Millions of dollars goes to the EMS agency. <laughs> That's our goal. We want to make sure that the EMS EMS gets the money directly. So, and we'll continue to um, to reach out and some regional meetings coming up probably next year. So it'll be it'll be a busy two years. It's gonna we're gonna have to have a presence because there are so many new legislators. Jerry, what's cooking? And so even with all the positive things, there's still EMS crisis happening across Pennsylvania. Just just uh, within the last month, uh, an ambulance service in rural Pennsylvania has uh, along the New York state border has decided to uh, discontinue service. There's another service in rural Pennsylvania that is having their ambulances are out of service because they don't have any money to put brakes on the ambulance. In central Pennsylvania here, two fire-based uh, services went out of business within the last uh, year or two. And, uh, you know, those concerns, we are aware of those things that are happening. Uh, and, and we are also aware that, uh, you know, the concept of deregulation of EMS is out there. Uh, uh, members uh, of EMS meeting and talking about, well, we have all these state regulations and what can we change to do that? And what does that look like? And there needs to be further discussions on that. Um, you know, the uh, National Registry exam uh, issue is not going to go away. I think that is going to continue. And those of you that are not familiar with that is um, there was a push by EMS providers and, and there still is a push by EMS providers to return to the way it used to be for testing of uh, EMTs in Pennsylvania. And uh, those conversations are happening. And uh, you know those are the challenges that we are going to continue to face as uh, solutions are, are, are come to a consensus on solutions on where we need to go with EMS. Uh, what does that rural solution look like to ensure an ambulance shows up? What are the what is that suburban solution? What is that um, what is that urban solution to ensure that these organizations are healthy, that they're funded, that the workforce is uh, the, that the workforce feels that they're appreciative, they're appreciated and that they're fairly compensated. And, and what does that look like? I talked to several of you today uh, in this room about some of the local challenges that you're continuing to have. And, uh, you know, this is, as I've stated many times, um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. It has to be continually worked on. We cannot stop and we have to continue to work together forward to ensure that an ambulance shows up, uh, that a fire truck shows up with trained people uh, that are compassionate and, and uh, empathetic and ready to take care of uh, the community when needed. Thank you. I, you know, you, you mentioned some of these challenges and I, you know, talking to some attendees here before the session began um, and experiencing this nationwide and working with our clients across the country. I can tell you that I think the biggest issue that EMS agencies have is staffing right now is personnel. And you know, you talked about fairly compensated. Of course, we know that the pay level of some of our professionals in Pennsylvania is volunteer. Um, so I, I used to be sort of, why don't we make EMS operating funds available to pay people, right? Which has always been an issue. But um, it seems to me that even agencies that pay people are having the same, if not more difficult problems than the volunteer agencies. So that's an SR6 issue as well. But I wondered if anybody on the panel, and, and please, I'm, I, I fully understand I'm asking the impossible question because if there was a magic bullet, uh, we'd all know about it. But does anyone on the panel have any thoughts about that? Because that is proving in some areas to be a limiting factor on the kinds of services that we can provide to the public um, is just having the people to do that. So with that uh, very easy question, but very difficult answers, I'm sure, does anybody wanna weigh in on that? You're all going looking at each other going, yeah, it's just <laughs> in, in terms of staffing. I mean, look, uh, every area, um, you know, particularly in, in, in uh, public safety, you know, 
and I'm a local township commissioner, you know, and, and you know, you're not, we're not getting the same amount of applicants on, on police, you know, certainly the fire, you know, and, and EMS world, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, the number, we know where the numbers are and where they've had it. And, and certainly COVID, uh, post COVID uh, hasn't been kind to us in, in any of these realms. And so everybody's looking, you just had a conversation uh, uh, from my senator, uh, senator, um, you know, free veterans training uh, or training for, for veterans, you know, and, and, just trying to get those folks to, um, you know, reach out to them. They're having a difficult time. So, you know, a lot of this is out there, you know, the trainings out there, the, um, the sports out there to, to get, you just get, you know, you gotta, you gotta find a way to, uh, to, to get uh, people uh, in the door. And, you know, a lot of the efforts here, uh, particularly in what was just passed with house bill 397, the recruitment and retention aspect of it, uh, there's going to be a, another a pilot with a uh, higher education and basic education. So I'm looking forward to seeing how something like that can, you know, attract young people, get them in the door. Uh, and, you know, obviously we have the, the bigger issue then in terms of uh, paying, uh, you know, and how do you, how do you provide a, uh, a decent wage for these folks? That's, that's the, the nut, tough nut to crack then. Right. And, you know, hopefully the, the increases in reimbursement can start to help with that. Um, in addition to the Medicaid increases, you know, Medicare rates have gone up or will go up in January by 8.7%, right? So there's a little bit of relief. I mean, the downside of that is that, that increase is tied to inflation and stuff costs more. So, you know, that that's probably a wash, but, uh, you know, but that that is that continues to be one of the struggles that our, that our industry and our professions have. So uh, other questions from our audience? Yes. Hmm. Well, Dan Pedersen from Page Wolfberg and Worth is here. Uh, <laughs> Dan, are you familiar with that? Um, not enough to make any significant comments. So I will. Yeah, explain. that that phrase, the substantial impediment. I I have not previously heard that. Um, let, let me just quickly repeat or paraphrase what the question was, and I I think it focused on the issue of Medicare Advantage, which are the Medicare Part C replacement plans um, and reimbursement to providers under, under those plans. So without being able to speak to the specifics of the question, uh, generally uh, we're seeing a, a big trend from people going from Medicare Part B fee-for-service into Medicare Part C, Medicare Advantage. Uh, we're going to be up around 50% of all Medicare beneficiaries in the Medicare replacement programs within the next probably two years. Uh, so the other thing, I really, I think the main lesson here as we move into more and more managed care and the other thing that's hanging out over, on, over us on the federal level, Heather talked about dodging the surprise billing issue at the state level, the federal legislation called the No Surprises Act, which took effect in January, applies to air ambulances. But all you have to do is Google that and you'll see tons of commentary and articles from, from consumer groups and patient groups and others saying, why doesn't that apply to air or to ground ambulance? And that there is a commission formed by the No Surprises Act to study the application of that balanced billing law to ground ambulance. A couple of years before the No Surprises Act, there was a commission to study it for air ambulance. So they study it, they pass it, and that's the, that's the phase we're in right now for the ground ambulance services. So it is more likely than not, in my opinion, not being a legislative expert, that the federal No Surprises Act will uh, eventually include ground ambulance uh, as well. The upside or downside, if you wanna call it that, of all of that is it's really time, I think, for ambulance services to start knocking on the door of their insurers, their managed care plans and their payer networks uh, and start exploring contracting with those payers. And folks, even if those discussions don't result in successful, you know, they say no thanks and the networks aren't interested. One of the factors that arbitrators use to establish what payment rate they're gonna select, because if you're out of network, 
right? And you want your whole bill paid and the insurer says, well, our, what we deem reasonable is what we're gonna pay. The, the, the effort by one or either party to enter into an agreement is a factor that the arbitrators explicitly under that law can use against the other party. Here's all the copies of the emails and all the copies of the requests and letters we've sent trying to join these payer networks, right? So even if we don't succeed in that, by being the parties who reach out and try to explore those negotiations and enter into those payer agreements, will benefit ground ambulance services when they have to take those claims to arbitration as the law uh, provides, at least as it stands right now for the air ambulances. So, and not only that, but I'm, I'm not saying to do it just to go through the pro forma of saying, yeah, we asked, but is to enter into agreements for that hopefully are at sustainable payment amounts uh, because uh, that takes the uncertainty, the time, the delays, the expense of arbitration and all of that out of the picture if we can resolve those payment rates. Uh, the other thing I wanna say when we talk to our insurers, let's, it's a hackneyed phrase, think outside the box because we are as an ambulance profession in any event paid essentially for transporting patients. But doesn't it make more sense that we talk with those payer networks about compensating us for non-transport services as well? You know, Pennsylvania law does talk about that, uh, but we can enter into agreements with payers for a whole range of services, healthcare services that keep their members healthy, that we can provide that care in less acute and less expensive settings by transitioning from just EMS and ambulance transport to mobile healthcare. And we can demonstrate true value to payers by providing a whole range of services in the community that don't necessarily involve a 911 transport to, to a call. And you know, if I'm a payer and I can pay an ambulance provider or an EMS agency a few hundred bucks to do that treatment on scene and avoid the bill of a few thousand bucks in the emergency department, we've got, I think, room to add value to when we ask for certain rates in those transport contracts. So we, we can look use that also as an opportunity to look at a big picture. So other questions or first any responses from the panel or any other things to add about the little soapbox I just found myself on. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to kind of add to that the, the data collection that Medicare is doing. I'm hoping that that will be favorable for us so that they will actually look at that, that it actually does cost more than what they pay. Because even though the GAO report said that they don't cover the cost. It'll be nice to see that data collection. Yeah, let me quick uh, just uh, add to what, what Heather's talking about. Medicare at the federal level has a project going on right now called Ground Ambulance Cost Data Collection. And for the first time, CMS is collecting cost data uh, with a survey instrument that all ambulance services in the country who are enrolled in Medicare will have to complete. This year, we're collecting data on about half of the ambulance services. Next year will be a quarter, and then the year after that will be another quarter, so that we'll get all of them. So if you're one of the agencies that is selected for cost reporting this year, uh, time is running out. You'll, you'll have to start that reporting process as early as January, uh, but that is a, a huge opportunity uh, to demonstrate not only to Medicare, but to other payers, Absolutely. what our costs are, are of providing these services and to make that case to be compensated at, at more than cost. So it's a great, great yeah. point. Thank and you. And we just, we did a, um, a webinar on the data collection back in August and the AAA is actually gonna be coming out to our reimbursement conference in May. So if anybody's not having to report in January and you still have questions, they will be there to answer those questions. Great, and that's the American Ambulance Association, not the American Automobile Association, oh, by the sorry. way. Oh, sorry, It's all right, it's all right. Jerry it. warned us about it. throwing out all of our acronyms. <laughs> Uh, anyone else on the panel want to add anything to what we've been discussing? Um, anyone? If not, I, I want to give the audience another opportunity to ask any additional questions that may have cropped up in our recent discussions here. Anyone have anything for our, our panelists? Do, do my friends from uh, the Northern County wish to ask the question we talked about earlier? Okay. All right. As we all go, what was it? What was it? Yeah, yes, sir. Municipal um, the, the car and um, So, in where it's landed, it's landed. 
favorable in most situations. Uh, the Mannheim one came out as a surprise. Um, and I was curious if they, if you knew why. Uh, the question was with the municipal authority, we're gonna have a whole presentation on that next. The question was specifically about the Mannheim one and why that didn't land. I'm not familiar with that case study, Ryan or Matt. Anything? I think that that is still in process. That is still in process. There is, there's, it's still in process and, and there's, there's people working on it. There's a, there's a website that details all of that. And uh, it's a 12 municipality model. And, uh, you know, they should know by, by the end of this year, if, uh, what the outcome will that, what that will look like. Other questions. Okay, let me uh, go round robin on the panel here uh, quickly. Actually, let's start. Let's start on this side uh, and uh, ask for closing thoughts uh, before we uh, before we let you go. Any parting words of wisdom, past, present, or future? Uh, I'm just going to end with uh, just a follow up in the, the discussion we just had in the last 10, 10 minutes. Uh, Jerry has heard me say this before. Uh, this applies to the fire service as well, is the system is built on three pillars, funding, staffing, and training. Uh, it can be argued that you can't have uh, staffing and training if you don't have the funding. So that's why I like to focus on the funding side of it is, as we did with the fireworks tax, that's why I think that is a very important part of what we did. And we need to see what happens as that gets rolled out. And we can make adjustments uh, as, as needed from that standpoint. Uh, we just need to infuse the system with funding as much as we can so everything else can fall from there. Having said that, I said before, I'm going to continue to do what I can as I have for the past 17 years to help the EMS community. Thank you. And I appreciate being here. Thank you, Sean. Nate? Doug, thanks for having us again. Um, Sean mentioned it earlier in terms of implementation. There's a number of bills here from the prior session as well as now this session that need to be implemented. We need to hear that they're working. And if they're not working, we need to know why and how, how to correct that. So, you know, from uh, I mentioned Act 91 of, of 2020, you know, that that was an omnibus measure uh, uh, within the, uh, the more the fire uh, community. It's, it impacted uh, EMS as well, you know, first responder tax credits, et cetera. Um, you know, we need to know that that laws uh, implemented uh, the mental health, mental wellness and stress, stress management act act 69 of, of 2019 uh, department of health is working on need to know that, you know, that's, that's moving along and, and uh, doing as it envisioned in terms of helping our uh, first responders on that front. Um, <clears throat> the EMS compact and again, you know, uh, an issue that sprung up from from this room here in past sessions. You know, I'm pleased that it's done, but now it's it's important that it, uh, Pennsylvania fully embrace that and, and be a part of the, uh, the the compact on that front. Uh, Jerry mentioned it earlier in terms of you know some potential issues. Uh, hearings are are certainly in order on a number of these fronts. Um, the National Registry, uh, for example. You know, let's let's talk about you know, and if and if there's pockets out there that um, the students are failing or not passing that exam. You know why is that? Can is there is there a better model to use on that front, or is it you know sim, you know I don't know whether scrapping the national exam is is particularly the answer on that front, uh, but perhaps there's another another way to do it. So uh, hearings I think can help out in that front. Um, recruitment you heard me earlier on that. Are there additional ways that we can promote recruitment? You know, getting uh, the next generation uh, in the door at least uh, pique their interest. Um, lastly, we did establish the, the reestablish the fire and EMS caucus uh, this uh, past year, and we're uh, hopeful to continue to keep that up and running, and you know to continue to air issues from from that angle as well. So, you know, when you're speaking to your uh, local house member, a senator, you know, ask them to join the the fire and EMS caucus. You know, uh, you know they all you know, everybody supports, but you know have them take that an another step in that direction to uh, to to join something like that. Great. Thank you. Nate. And you said one thing that triggered a, c a concern that I've been harboring and I know some folks have been talking about. We're going to have a generation of folks coming out of high schools uh, who are going to have uh, some demonstrated learning outcome deficiencies because of remote instruction during the pandemic. That's being pretty well documented. The challenges that we're talking about here with the registry exam and training and getting new providers into the system uh, may well be exacerbated. Uh, when we encounter those folks coming out into the training programs and into the workforce. Um, and I, I think that's something that everyone who's involved in the training and the education side is going to have to start uh, thinking about. Our programs may need to be undertaking remedial 
uh, education and, and doing some things to get those folks prepared for the kind of education we need to give them in EMS. Jerry. Well, I encourage everyone to uh, have the difficult dis discussions. Uh, if we, our system has been pretty s the same in Pennsylvania for many, many years in a variety of different ways. Uh, you know, how we are system, how our system is set up, how we're integrated at the local level, how we're dispatched, very, very, very same. I, I go across PA and see things that are very similar. But I encourage you to have the difficult to sit discussions with all the key stakeholders. If things are not working, extended response times, lack of EM, uh, people coming in the door, are the systems designed appropriately? You, there, there's times that people say, you know, you know, we should have regionalized 15 years ago. Well, time to have the difficult discussions, and I encourage you to push that. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, Heather. <laughs> Thank you for letting me go first um, to start. First of all, I wanted to thank Widener again for, for hosting this. I think that this is a wonderful opportunity and it's nice to see faces, especially EMS, to, to take the time to come out. Um, I think we just need to continue the education. We just need to stay involved. You need to be active. You know, it's hard to have a crystal ball to see where things are going to go. And um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done as everybody has kind of outlined. So I don't think I really need to reiterate that. But if anybody has any questions, Jerry and I are happy to answer any questions at any time, emails, phone calls, whatever you need. We're happy to help you stay, keep your legislators informed. Thank you. Join these organizations, please. Uh, folks, the, the four people who have more to do with the passage of these successful legislative initiatives, more so than any other four people in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania are sitting right here. Please join me in thanking them for doing that and for sharing their expertise with us today. Thank you. Okay, folks, while our panel is, uh, is uh, taking their leave, uh, I want to bring up our next two presenters uh, who will be talking about the Pennsylvania Municipal Authorities Act, something we've heard a little bit about so far in our discussions this morning, uh, and its potential application as a new model for EMS agencies uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then after this, we will have a, a buffet lunch, and then we'll have the closing keynote, and uh, we will uh, proceed thusly. So first, I want to introduce, and I guess you guys are going to tag team this. We are. Yeah. We're waiting for microphones right now. Waiting for microphones? Oh, oh, you're going to go out in the audience and do your thing. We're going to do a duet. That's, oh, a duet. Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, so while they're getting mic'd up, thank you, Brian. Brian Fernball, who has been handling a lot of our technical needs here this morning from the law school. Uh, I want to introduce uh, these two gentlemen, uh, Ryan Stark and Matt Konya. Uh, both, yay, Ryan and Matt. Both of these gentlemen are graduates of this school. I guess I should announce that I am as well. Uh, I'm a 1996 graduate. Ryan is a 2007 graduate. Matt is a 2017 graduate. Uh, both were former students in the health law class that I teach as an adjunct professor here. And uh, after their semester long job interviews were both hired at Page Wolf Bergen Worth. Uh, Matt is an associate attorney who's been with us since 2017. Uh, Ryan, uh, a few years ago, was named a partner at Page Wolf Bergenworth and uh, has been with us since uh, 2007, at first as a law clerk and then as an associate now as a partner. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleagues, uh, as well as fellow alumni of this school, uh, Ryan Stark and Matt Konya. Gentlemen. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Cue up our presentation here. Okay. Good to go. I guess I'll, I'll handle yeah, advancement here. I'll, I'll All right, you just tell me when you're ready. So uh, good morning, everyone. Want to, uh, again, thank Widener and reiterate, you know, how important it is to have these discussions and have people at the table. These, these things are so instrumental in getting things out into the forefront and having people at the table, you know, and it always seems like we're in this dynamic. We're always the David in the David and Goliath, right? So, you know, I read a book recently by Malcolm Gladwell, and he talks about that particular battle and what he says is that unbeknownst to a lot of people, David was a really skillful slinger. And when he went up against Goliath, Goliath was weighed down with a lot of armor, right? So what we need to do is be strategic when we're at the table with insurers, when we're at the table with hospitals and other Goliaths in the room, we gotta be strategic about that action. 
And what Matt and I are going to talk to you about this morning is giving you a, basically a rock, you know, to put your sling here. This is another model um, that's already um, in written into the legislation that agencies can think about implementing, you know, if they're struggling, if they're lacking in resources, which many agencies are. And by the way, when we get to the portion about fees, remind me, it was you, the gentleman that asked about Mannheim. I looked it up really quick. So I, we Google, you know, lawyers use Google all the time as well. So I will uh, address that question as well. So Matt, any remarks to kick us off here? Um, yeah, and I guess I'll use my experience as a field provider. For field providers out there, we're taught to use every tool in the toolkit. This presentation is talking about another tool in that toolkit, whether it be for funding purposes, um, revenue and retention for employees, or just getting staff through the door. We're just talking about another tool in the toolkit to help improve EMS in the Commonwealth. All right, let's kick it off with that. So quick overview of what we're going to cover here. We're going to talk about common you know, structures, agency structures in Pennsylvania. And uh, we know we're going to reiterate some of the issues that have already been hit on this morning that are facing a lot of agencies in your agency right now in the industry. And then we'll talk about this uh, Municipality Authorities Act. We commonly refer them to as you know municipal authorities. The act is actually called the Municipality Authorities Act in Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll also talk about some recent uh, litigation that sort of adds credence to the uh, ability for agencies to exist under the Municipality Authorities Act, and then some of the benefits as well. So with that, I'll, Matt, I'll let you kick off with some of the common agency structures here. Um, so for those of you who may not be involved in EMS all the time, this may come as a little bit of a surprise to you. Typically, when we think of EMS, we think of a government-based agency that responds to your emergency. However, the vast majority of EMS agencies in Pennsylvania are actually private nonprofits. Um, we don't have county-based systems, really. You really do not see the government-owned or operated ambulances responding. So in the state of Pennsylvania, we have those for-profit. We have private for-profit ambulance services that come out and provide services at your house, transport you between hospitals. We also have the mixed services that are nonprofits. Typically in the state of Pennsylvania, you're going to get a paid slash volunteer combination station. I think that's one of the most common ways that EMS agencies are staffed. And the reason for that is simple. EMS for the longest time in Pennsylvania was a volunteer organization type of model. It was based out of fire companies, fire companies in the state of Pennsylvania for the vast majority of them are volunteer. The problem with that is the amount of time an individual has to spend to be proficient in EMS almost is a disincentive to be a 100% volunteer organization. Most of the organizations I meet with are mixed. I actually worked with one organization in the Lancaster area that was 100% volunteer. Um, and in talking with them, they said, we're getting to the point where we need to hire individuals to keep ambulances on the street. Because again, the amount of time taken up by volunteering in EMS is really detrimental to some people and they need to start providing paid individuals on their ambulance to keep their staffing level up. We also have hospital-based EMS agencies. Um, in this area, I know Lifeline EMS out of Hershey, Life Team UPMC are those hospital-based ambulance services. A lot of those are just extensions of the hospital to get people to provide care. And it was something that was needed by the local hospital to start these ambulance services because there's no one else there to do it at the time. There are a few municipal owned and operated services. Um, those are kind of the rarity in my experience. Mostly you had the private nonprofit, but these are the ones that are actually owned and operated by the municipality. There can be fire-based, they can be third service type of organizations and maybe a local rescue squad or something like that that started the ambulance because it was need. The one thing in EMS in Pennsylvania, a lot of it is need-based. There was a hole in care. There was not enough individuals to provide those medical care to patients in the field. So local fire departments, other nonprofits stepped up and filled those roles. And then there are municipal authorities. Um, this is kind of one of the more rare types of EMS organizations you'll find in the state of Pennsylvania. And we'll talk about in the next couple of slides, certain examples of municipal authorities in the Commonwealth. Yeah. And in terms of resources, not all agencies are created equal, right? 
if you're a hospital-based provider, you know, we talk about that cost of readiness. We're getting reimbursed while the patient's in the back of the ambulance. What about the rest of the time we're not performing a service? Technically, we're not receiving any reimbursement, at least from payers, for those services. A hospital gets that DRG payment. As long as somebody is admitted to a bed for that day, they get a 24-hour DRG payment, and that's reimbursing them for their cost of readiness. So hospital-based ambulance services, and when you think about municipally owned and operated ambulance services, what do they have access to? Taxpayer dollars, right? So, you know, more resources. Municipal authorities, actually, we're, we're going to talk about them. There might be some, some additional incentives for municipalities to buck up and, you know, and support these agencies. So let's get into it. Um, currently, there are eight municipal authorities in Pennsylvania. And it looks like there's an initiative ongoing in Mannheim right now. I'm surprised I didn't know about this. I'm from the town of Mount Joy. They're actually involved in this initiative as well. So there are agencies from a lot of the different townships there. What they're thinking about doing is forming a municipal authority together to provide services. And we'll talk about why we might want to do that. So here are, go ahead, Matt. Um, one thing I wanted oh. to add to that, if you look at the location of these municipal authorities, they're oh, yeah. mainly in central and western Pennsylvania. Um, the reason for that, I don't know, but it is kind of an oddity. It's not something we see out in the eastern part of the Commonwealth. So, yeah, it's a good point. I think the far farthest eastern one is Huntington. Huntington. Yep. So anyway, Matt, I'll let you go through. These are just a list of. Yeah, these age. are just a list. And you can see they're actually in chronological order of when they were formed. So the first one in the, was in the early 70s. Uh, the most recent one that was formed seems like in the late 90s. Um, Valley Ambulance, which is, again, out in the Pittsburgh area. Quaker Valley Ambulance Authority, again, around the Pittsburgh area. McCrainless Franklin Park Ambulance Authority, again, Pittsburgh area. Ross Vest Westview, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but again, out in the Pittsburgh area. Um, AMED Authority is actually located in Blair County in Altoona. Um, we're going to talk about AMED a little bit in our, some recent litigation that has arisen out of a municipal authorities. Uh, Medical Rescue Team South Authority, guess what? Pittsburgh area. Uh, McKeesport Ambulance Authority, again, I'm with a broken record here. It's out of the Pittsburgh area. And then Huntington Ambulance Authority, middle south central part of the uh, state out of Huntington County. So some of the issues, and these have already been highlighted a lot this morning. Of course, you know, we have the financial issues, you know, our reimbursement rates from federal payers, from Medicare, from Medicaid, and even third party payers do not even reimburse us for our cost of providing services in most cases. And with the pandemic and, and things, you know, what's been going on with inflation right now, we've seen inflation rates, you know, up to 10%. We're seeing skyrocketing costs, you know, fuel costs, upwards of $5 or more just recently. So really, really struggling on that. And, and by the way, you know, this has also come with the demand for wage increases. You know, one of the things that they're saying, I can't staff my ambulance because the sheets across the street is offering more money than us. And they're offering a $2,000 bonus to do work that might not be as stressful as what they're doing on the back of the ambulance. So we're up against these realities, you know, and having to offer bonuses and incentives. Folks, there are other ways to incentivize your folks outside of the financial. And we're not going to get into that now, but um, these are transactional things that are not sustainable long term. Matt, I'll let you talk about some of the staffing issues. Um, yeah, and one other thing I want to mention about skyrocketing costs. Um, we're in a health law kind of situation. We're going to talk about COVID for a second. PPE costs, disinfection costs for EMS agencies has skyrocketed in the last two years. Three years ago, you'd never see EMS providers in face masks all the time. Now, many face masks are worn on every single call. That's a cost. Uh, fogger machines, UV lights to disinfect eye ambulances, those are costs that many services didn't have to buy five, 10 years ago. Now it's an everyday reality. We need these things. So costs are going through the roof. Uh, talking about staffing, again, touch on COVID a little bit. There has been an impact of COVID on staffing. There are some providers that when COVID hit, they said, I'm done, especially if they were in a volunteer type organization. Pandemic came around, they didn't want to expose themselves to COVID, which no one can blame them for. So a lot of volunteers, some even part-time, some even full-time staff members stepped away. We also have the increasing age of EMS providers in the state of Pennsylvania. If you look at the demographic of EMS providers, they get older and older on average every single year. 
Well, as you get older and older, you get to that age where you want to retire. And once you retire, we don't have enough new providers coming out of school to fill the ranks of providers we are losing. There's also the mental health component to EMS. Um, mental health is something in EMS that we don't talk about often, but it is a cost. Burnout is very high. Compassion burnout is very high in the fields. So it's really hard to retain providers with all those factors going on. And then demands are up. Most EMS organizations in this room right now, if I ask you how your call volumes have trended in the last two years, it'll be the exact same story, through the roof. We went from running five to six calls to at the height of COVID running maybe 10 to 15 calls. The problem with that is, as the call volumes increase, the number of ambulances we have to respond to those calls doesn't increase. So that increases the workload on those already existing ambulances. It's not uncommon, especially in larger, busier areas, for an ambulance crew to come to the station at their morning check, take their ambulance, leave the station, and they don't see it for 12 hours until they get back to the station because there's no time, there's no downtime. All these things lead into staffing issues. And then that also leads into the financial issues because you have staff turnover, then you have to pay money to train new staff, you have to pay retention bonuses and things like that. And it's all interwoven. Yeah, we've really seen COVID being the catalyst for a lot of folks retiring. I mean, how many of you out there know somebody, no matter what field it was, right? You pull up to the McDonald's and they're only open in the drive through One of the main reasons for the, the shortage in the workforce nationwide is because COVID-19 was a catalyst for everybody to retire, right? A lot of folks were like, this is the point where if you're a teacher, whatever, you know, they were like, this is a good time to get out for me. So we had a lot of our workforce retiring as a result of COVID. And there weren't a lot of folks that stepped up to replace those. So let's talk about the history of municipal authorities in Pennsylvania. So we'll go back, you know, play the historical music here. This all started back, uh, back in the 1930s, uh, right after the Great Depression. And uh, we had municipalities nationwide that were defunct. They were broke, you know, and they... Uh, they wanted to beef up infrastructure that had been neglected for years. And think about, you know, it's pretty critical turning point. We have automobiles coming onto the streets and you know, a lot of things developing. But the municipalities, the feds wanted to dole out a lot of money to these municipalities, but the municipalities had to match those funds. So often because of debt limits, there are constitutional debt limits in place for municipalities. Why is that? Well, so the taxpayers don't put the burden of a, an expensive project. You know, for example, the Harrisburg incinerator, right? One of those projects where we, you know, the taxpayers were stuck holding the bill. Often they couldn't match those funds. So <clears throat> what happened was the, uh, they had the Municipality Authorities Act passed back in 1935. And then go ahead, Matt. Um, yeah, and then the act was actually replaced in 1945. The last amendment to the Municipal Authorities Act was actually in 2001. And basically what it allowed was for municipalities in the state of Pennsylvania to join together or to take out by themselves an or corporation that can provide for the public benefit. Um, it allows those organizations to perform projects and everything. They can borrow money outside of the missile debt limit. They're a corporation. And we'll talk about formation and everything here in a second, but they can take on their own debts. And the important thing about municipal authorities in the state of Pennsylvania is they have to be formed to serve certain project purposes. And we'll talk about authorized projects as we move through the presentation, but there are certain specific enumerated actions that these authorities can take and can use funds for after the creation by the municipality to ensure the common good of the Commonwealth. Yeah, it's kind of like the same principle behind becoming a nonprofit in Pennsylvania. If you undertake, you know, something for the public good, um, we're going to give you special status and there are special, you know, privileges that you get as a municipal authority. So when we think about traditional municipal authorities, you know, we think about water utilities, right? Sewage treatment, um, you know, transit authorities. So those are your traditional uh, municipal authorities. By the way, there's over uh, 1,500 municipal authorities in existence in the state of Pennsylvania today, eight of those being EMS municipal authorities that we just talked about. And it sounds like there's one on the cusp or potentially, we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about the issues there, which by the way, we have, you know, your, your authorities up here. Anybody ever buy these properties in Monopoly? 
No, but nobody <laughs> buys Waterworks or Electric Company, right? 10 times the amount of the dice rolled. So Matt, go ahead and talk about how they're incorporated separately. So they are separate incorporated bodies that are started by municipalities. So the local government's role in this is one or more municipalities get together and say, hey, we want to create a municipal authority for whatever purpose that's enumerated under the statute. Obviously, in this case, we're talking about EMS organizations. They have their independent ability to incur debt, finance properties or finance projects, I should say, take out loans, take out lines of credit, credit. And they also have certain municipal powers. And we'll talk about how those powers and privileges can be a benefit, particularly to EMS organizations. So after the municipalities get together or the single municipality determine that they want to create a municipal authority, there's certain regulation requirements they have to go through. Basically, what they have to do is they have to publish their ability, they have to publish their purpose and everything like that, articles and corporation. Municipal authorities sound very similar to special districts in other states. Um, common example, particularly relevant to the individuals in this room, are taxing districts for both fire and EMS. Those are really big in California. You have fire protection districts, you have EMS districts, Colorado, New York, a bunch of other states allow certain political subdivisions to create special taxing districts as a source of revenue to fund public works projects. Um, the current Municipality Authorities Act was approved again in 2001. Um, we had the citation for where the law is actually codified in the Pennsylvania statutes, and it requires a public work project. It has to be for the public good. So a municipality can't get together and create a municipal authority that doesn't have the public's best interest in heart. So I couldn't run a casino? You could not run a casino, unfortunately. That destroys the idea right that I had yesterday. <laughs> so it has to be able to improve the life and the benefit the commonwealth itself. And it must be also self-sustaining. So it has to be able to be something that can run by itself. So think of it as a corporation, just created in a special way with certain special powers and privileges. So let's get in a little bit to the logistics of uh, formation of how we do this. So again, the idea comes up, maybe we live in a community where you know we're seeing coverage outages in particular areas. And the other agencies within that region are saying we're constantly have to, having to cover your, you know, your first due response area. Why don't we all get together and talk about forming an entity that can cover this entire area? So this is just getting a little bit into the weeds about, you know, the logistics of formation. Matt, I'll let you. You're, you're the the logistics guy. Yeah. Um. So basically, as I kind of gave this away a little bit earlier, the municipalities, either one or more, have to get together, have to adopt a resolution or an ordinance that signifies their intent to form a municipal authority. It also has to have a notice and comment period. They just simply can't do it at some closed door meeting and try to push it through that way. Um, one of the examples brought up is Mannheim with their possible municipal authority. If you read into how that was formed, there's certain meetings that have to take place. First off, there was a meeting that basically the municipalities that wanted to join or possibly start that municipal authority, how to get together, how to make a public statement, how to make a statement of the purpose. There were additional meetings for other political subdivisions that would like to join. Once adopted, the notice and that resolution has to be published in a newspaper or of a legal journal. That sounds very similar to how a corporation is started in the state of Pennsylvania. It's no surprise that these municipal authorities, because they're quasi corporate bodies, do go through the same notice comment that need to take place for corporations, especially nonprofit corporations. Articles and corporations need to be filed with the Secretary of the Commonwealth. There's very specific statements that must be in those incorporating documents. I'm not going to bore you with the details of them. They are in the Municipals Authority Act. Basically, it's the common stuff, the name of the organization, the purpose, things like that, just so the government knows what is actually going on, knows the purpose of the municipal authority, knows what to call it, knows where its incorporating headquarters are, knows who its board members are. Yeah, and this is open, by the way, for any, you know, municipality that includes boroughs, uh, cities of what is it, first, second, and first third sector, class in yeah. Pennsylvania, and towns. Does anybody know for bonus points, anybody know what the only town in Pennsylvania is? Yep. Bloomsburg. All right, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here. Very, very... <laughs> 
we're out of here. We're done, Matt. All right. So the, one of the key things that Matt talked about here, it's got to be for a purpose right. that's permitted by the municipality authorities code, right? Like you can't just be a nonprofit. Not right? you know, it's got to be for the reason of a, of a public person. Same thing or public purpose. So same thing under the municipal authorities. They and here are the listed reasons for which they can exist. Okay, we're just going to go through a bunch of them. This isn't an exhaustive list of what's included, but here are some of the um, uh, listed purposes that you can form a municipal authority. So, and it says here, you know, the purpose doesn't power. It says projects of the following kind of character. So let's go through these. Uh, first, you can exist to you can lease equipment for the municipality so this includes let's say you have you want to purchase school buses lease them to a school district things like that construct buildings that are solely devoted or partially devoted to public use think of your schools libraries public buildings like that yep. um transportation uh the highlighting is not a mistake we will come back to that but transportation, marketing, shopping terminals, this is to typically thought of as your transit, your city buses, the Capital Transit Authority, any of you from the Center County or Central Pennsylvania region, you have CATA, the Center of Transit Authority that runs buses out there, parks, recreational grounds, sewer, sewer systems. Or parts thereof. Or parts right? thereof. There you so, uh, you know, in thereof. addition to providing the service, you get to potentially use eminent domain power for egress. And, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, how that power lies. Foreshadowing? It, it could be, yeah. Um, uh, go ahead. Go on. Uh, facilities for collection removal. These are your trash removal. Um, incinerators, it's probably a little bit of a touchy subject in the city of Harrisburg. Um, steam heating plants and distribution systems, waterworks. As you can see, all of these things are for the public good. Uh, hospitals and health centers are one of the things that are expressly authorized here. Um, in addition, buildings that facilitate, you know, private, nonprofit, non-secretary and secretary or uh, secondary schools and motor buses for public use when motor buses are used. So that's getting into the, when you look at Pennsylvania law, you know, some of these laws have been written a long time ago. This law was written back in 1935, right? So we're specifying here that it can't be a horse-drawn bus. So that's still <laughs> that still exists in the uh, in the statute here. Um, industrial development, stormwater planning, things of that nature. So any of you hear us mention anything related to fire and emergency medical services in that list? No. So go ahead, Matt. Yeah. Um, so from the enumerated sections we went over in the statute, EMS and fire by extension is not explicitly authorized by the act. Um, the common thought is if there was a challenge, and I want to be clear, there has not been a court challenge to an EMS municipal authority claiming that EMS is not a proper project under the act, but typically it's seen as a transportation mode. I know it's kind of weird to think about because EMS is a lot more than taking someone to the hospital, it's treatment, it's care provided to that patient. However, at the end of the day, we are transporting individuals to the hospital. It can also possibly be seen as a hospital or healthcare center. In the statute, we talked about that it has to be projects of similar natures. I think there could be an argument that EMS falls under healthcare centers because it has that health component. But again, at the end of the day, there has been no challenges to any municipal authorities created for EMS benefit as not being a valid project under the act. Yeah, point being, there's already eight existing, and you know, I'm sure that there was an attorney involved in the Mannheim project that advised them that, yeah, we think there's solid ground here to establish a municipal authority to provide emergency medical services. There is a bill that's currently pending that was introduced in 2020. There hasn't been much movement on that bill yet that would expressly include it under the act. And that bill also proposed a countywide model for the municipal authority model. But again, we have not seen much uh, movement on that bill. But let's talk about a recent case that we think maybe gives a little bit of support here. And I had a discussion with Mr. Ken Brody this morning. He was taking me to task a little bit about this, but here is the case, okay? In condemnation of Powell. Condemnation means we're gonna take your property, right? We wanna take either a portion or your entire property. So this dealt with the power to exercise government functions, in this case, eminent domain, right? Which is a pretty freaking strong power because that's taking somebody's land, potentially somebody's home. So what happened here, 
and, and Matt, no, I'll let you talk about because you have personal knowledge of the, uh, the facts of this case. Yeah, um, a little bit of the background on this case. Interestingly enough, um, AMED is obviously an EMS organization. It's a municipal authority in the Altoona area. PAL is actually an EMS provider in the area. So basically, yeah, exactly. The ooze go up. It's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. So basically what happened in this situation is AMED built a new building. To get power transmission lines to that building, they needed to condemn part of PAL's property to reach their building. Um, they did it under what they believed was their eminent domain powers that was inherent to them because they were a municipal authority. They condemned about a 10-foot encroachment into PAL's property for those transmission lines. Um, there was a declaratory action filed in Blair County Court of Common Pleas, which was the proper venue for an action like this. Pal actually filed eight preliminary objections, all of which were denied by the Court of Common Pleas. A uh, little bit more backstory is after the denial of the preliminary objections, he filed for reconsideration of his case, and that was also denied by the Court of Common Pleas. Um, so they put up the power wires, bottom line. Yeah. Um, they put up power wires that hung 40, 40 feet above this gentleman's property. They took down a couple of trees on the property. Power wires exist. So they uh, they appeal. One of the preliminary objections, by the way, was challenging the authority. And uh, one of the preliminary objections, he said that AMED was not a valid municipal authority under the Municipal Authorities Act and therefore did have any power to exercise eminent domain. But they appealed. And on appeal, guess what? This individual did not raise that particular argument on appeal. But let's talk about what the court said. Yeah, so at the end of the day, it said Ahmed did not have the statutory power to condemn the property for the purpose of installing the electrical transmission lines. However, what's kind of inherent in that with that discussion, and we'll talk about some quotes from the Commonwealth Court about whether or not Ahmed may or may not have been a municipal authority. So eminent domain, obviously when we're taking somebody's property, it has to be strictly construed. We don't want the government to be able to take anybody's property for whatever reason they see fit. So statutes that allow the power of eminent domain in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania have to be strictly construed. So municipal authorities do have the power of eminent domain, statutory um, provisions are on the screen, but what's very key is, the power of eminent domain has to be within one of the projects that are authorized by the act. Basically, at the end of the day, the Commonwealth Court said AMED did not have the power statutorily to erect those power lines and use the power of eminent domain because the power transmission lines are limited for the purposes of generating power or transmitting power, which is one of the functions that is specifically enumerated by the uh, power of the municipal authority. In this case, AMED wasn't erecting the power lines to transmit power from a power generation station to a third party buyer or something like that. They were just using eminent domain to bring power lines to their station. Yeah, this was really strictly construed. Had they been a hydroelectric plant, they maybe you could have run, run them across a couple of folks' properties to get it to the appropriate location. You're an ambulance service. You just built a new building. You took a little bit of the guy's fee simple, right? So we're upset with that. I mean, those are inherent, inherent rights that you have. Here are some of the key quotes that we distilled from this. Really, you know, what we think this case stands for, and they did say... Uh, AMED is a municipal authority organized under the, the uh, Municipality Authorities Act. They said that. However, there was a footnote uh, right next to that. It said, by the way, uh, Powell did not raise this in his preliminary objections. He waived this for Commonwealth Court. So essentially what they said is we're not deciding this particular issue, which makes it what, Mr. Ken? Dicta. Dicta. Dicta, meaning it didn't wasn't instrumental to deciding the case, meaning it's only persuasive other courts don't necessarily have to follow that exact determination. But here's the other quote that I think is even more important. AMED's statutory power under 5607 to 5615 relate to the generation of electronic power, blah, 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 blah. The first couple of words of that statement, AMED's statutory power under sections 5607 and 5615, inherent in that they are saying that they have powers under the Municipal Authorities Act. I don't think this court would have 
said we have to, they would have said, we don't even have to get to whether or not this is narrowly construed. They're not, they're not a municipal authority clearly under the act. I think that implicit in that statement is the fact that you do get those powers. They just went above their eminent domain power here. I mean, absolutely. I think that's um, the best way to kind of surmise the entire court's opinion. It wasn't AMED is an authority, so we don't even have to get into the minutia of whether or not eminent domain powers are valid for this particular purpose. The Commonwealth Court decided with kind of the thought that AMED is a municipal authority and doesn't violate the Municipal Authorities Act because they were talking about the power that is inherent of a municipal authority. So what's that mean? It means, hey, what if I'm thinking about starting a municipal authority, right? And we go to my lawyer. My lawyer is like, well... You know what? There's eight other people doing it, right? Which is never good legal advice just because somebody else is doing it, right? Now, I think we have, albeit dictum, dicta in the case, I think we have something solid to hang our hat on. And I, I think I would feel confident in saying, yeah, you guys are able to establish a municipal authority. So with that, the key question is, why would we want to form one, right? So uh, let's talk about some of the key benefits here. Um, yeah, so just kind of an overview of the benefits, and then we'll kind of go through each one of them one by one. You have certain financial benefits. Um, there's increased liability protections. We'll talk about the interaction between the Municipality Torts Claims Act and municipal authorities, better governmental oversight of the EMS organization. Along with that, there's increased cooperation and cost sharing between municipalities, especially if multiple municipalities are part of the municipal authority. There's also tax exempt status, which is actually statutorial. And they'll talk about possible access to the GEMT program. I know Heather mentioned the GEMT program, but we'll talk about how municipal authorities may have an impact on who can exactly receive those funds. Yeah, and in terms of financial benefits, when we talk about making up the delta between the reimbursement and what we need to sustain operations and going to the municipality to get, all we have right now are a couple of code provisions. Christy and I were talking about this yesterday that basically says the municipality, whatever it may be, a borough, township, whatever, has to support and provide EMS services and should provide an adequate amount of funding for the EMS service. So it, it essentially leaves it up then to them to decide what sort of adequate funding. When they form this, the municipality is part and parcel of this municipal authority. And oftentimes, the folks that sit on council for the borough or whomever also are on the, uh, the board of the municipal authority as well. So there's a very strong incentive to pay their fair share and to make sure that EMS is provided adequately and supported for their organizations. You know, it also allows them access to loans and grants, you know, that were, were restricted only to governmental entities because now they're becoming a governmental entity. And uh, there's the ability to obtain those resources. And think about the polling of resources. Again. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, um, use the example, we talked several times about the possible formation in Mannheim. Those are multiple bor boroughs coming together. So the resources for staff and even equipment, ambulances, so on and so forth, is a lot bigger. You're reaching out to more than just one organization, including multiple organizations in that. There's also some benefits for participation in workers' compensation, especially when you're attached to the local political subdivision. And there's also the possibility. Now, possibility, I want to make is very clear. There's a possibility of user or mandatory fees associated with an EMS municipal authority. So the Municipal Authorities Act clearly allows user fees or mandatory fees for certain projects. Water and sewer systems is the classic one. How many people here live in an area that has a sewer system? You have to pay a tap fee, you have to pay a maintenance fee required by the municipal authority. The legal basis for mandatory or user fees for EMS municipal authorities is questionable. Currently of the eight municipal authorities out there that are focused on EMS, none of them charge a user fee. That may be because no one wants to be the first one to do it. You don't want to be the one to get sued first because that's really expensive. But it's not a complete bar, so it is questionable. It is the ability to generate funding from those fees, which for some EMS organizations could be a lifeline to keep them afloat. Which gets to the very heart of your question. Um, 
you asked why the, the, the Manheim Initiative has stalled. Uh, from what I've derived, there was a public hearing that was held a few months ago. One of the things that they believe that they have the authority to do is to establish a municipal fee. And they're proposing currently a $75 to $85 annual fee for the residents of those communities from this municipal authority. The residents don't like it. They think I've already paid my taxes. That should cover my fire, my EMS, and my police, right? So there's strong opposition among the public right now concerning that user fee. Yes, question back. I'm all for it because kind of that organization. A lot of people think. Appreciate that. And I'll just summarize here. Um, gentleman has personal experience and is involved in the process in the Mannheim area. And uh, essentially, there's public, there's some, some strong public sentiment against it because they feel as though this initiative is has been done in secret, um, that they're shoving this down their throats. It's a take it or leave it type proposition. Um, really, the, the take home point from that is if you do decide to go this route, be as transparent as possible with your residents. You know, you conduct open me meetings in, in the open as much as you can. And if you're thinking about instituting something like a fee, that ought to be on the on the books right away. It shouldn't be like a bait and switch where, all right, we're all in favor of the authority. And by the way, now we have the ability to charge all of the residents this amount of money. So appreciate that insight. There. And just to follow up on Ryan's comments, a lot of residents in the Commonwealth, if you were to ask them, is your EMS tax funded? They tell you yes even though that's not always the reality. So when you start talking about user fees, you need to kind of make it clear of, we're not already receiving tax revenue and they're gonna charge you another fee on top of that. This fee is the first one. And Mr. Wolfberg in the back has- I just wanted to make sure we clarify that when you talk about user fees, that doesn't preclude the municipal rate insurance billing that they would have Correct, correct. That's right. You could still bill, you know, payers and whatever financially responsible parties. You could still bill folks that don't have insurance for the provision of EMS. This is a fee that would be in addition to those. And these are, you know, um, so above and beyond what you could collect from, from billing insurance. So appreciate the clarification there. Other comments about that? But yeah, I, I really, like I said before, you need to be as transparent as possible if you're going to think about adopting this model. Um, we'll talk about increased liability protection. This might be one of the most compelling reasons um, to form a new municipal authority. Absolutely. And when we're talking about the Political Subdivision Torts Claims Act, to get to the provision that shows that municipal authorities are actually covered, it's kind of a rabbit trail. You have to fall and jump around. So under the Torts Claims Act, local agencies, which are covered by the Political Subdivision Torts Claims Act, is defined as a government unit other than the Commonwealth government, and it provides some other exclusive examples which are not relevant to this session. But then you have to jump to another statutory provision to get the definition of a governmental unit. And a governmental unit, among other things, is any political subdivision or municipal or other local authority. So local authorities or municipal authorities, excuse me, are considered part of a government unit, which is a local agency for the Political Subdivision Torts Claims Act. 
Um, this is really important because it provides protection for EMS providers. Um, I'll kick it over to Ryan and sure. talk so about the, some of those increased protections. This could be an additional layer of protection for your agency. So uh, a political subdivision may have absolute immunity for certain acts of its individuals. There are exceptions to that, okay? One of the big ones is, you know, the operation of a vehicle and things of that nature. But even for those exceptions, the... Um, the act here includes a $500,000 cap. So God forbid there's a catastrophic event, you know, where uh, there's, you know, injuries, possible death. Um, the, those damages against your organization will be capped at $500,000 under the Tort Claims Act. So it's really protection for your biggest risk out there. And you might say, well, don't I have immunity for that? Like we're an EMS agency. I thought I read somewhere my EMS Act provides me with immunity, Right. It provides immunity while your providers are providing care to the individual. One of the exceptions for immunity, for qualified, well, I should say qualified immunity, it's not absolute immunity. One of the exceptions for qualified immunity is the operation of an ambulance vehicle. So you do not get qualified higher level, uh, the proof of gross negligence there. So no, you are not covered for operation of the vehicles. And we uh, preach this all the time. One of the biggest risks for us out there is uh, our vehicle accidents. Um, just by their nature, because they're quasi-governmental, you have better government oversight. There's going to be reports. There should be increased transparency with municipal organizations. And it allows the municipal authorities to really have direct communication with their municipalities that form them. That makes the ability to react to emergencies better. If there's a funding crisis, if there's a shortage of some type staffing vehicles, it provides that direct communication. Transversely, it allows those government officials to be hands-on with the EMS organization. It's not that, well, we had the local ambulance, we contract to provide ambulance service to our municipality. We see them maybe once or twice a year at board meetings, they give a report, they say everything's going well, they walk out the door, everything's fine. No, if it's a municipal authority, these municipalities have to be on top of these organizations. So local governments can have their finger on the pulse of that EMS organization. No possible problems that are going to come up. Also know what's going well and what's working well. And then finally, kind of mentioned before, it should provide some increased transparency. There should be reports to the municipality about exactly what's going on. Some oversight of EMS organizations. It's no secret there have been cases where EMS and fire-based providers have mishandled money. In these situations, municipal oversight of these organizations should kind of alleviate any of those possible problems from occurring. Yeah, and one of the things that we hear, and we talked about on our panel earlier, when we come to our legislators, our representatives, um, oftentimes they say, you only come to me when you need something, you only come to me when there's a problem. When you have that constant connection and, and oversight of that agency, there's less of that. When you go to them, it's not like, hey, I don't even know you. It's We know intricately what's going, what's, uh, going on at the agency. We know what their financials look like. And we know if there's going to be a deficit for next year. So much better opportunity for increased revenues there. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Yeah. Um, also, the cooperation between municipalities. Again, a municipal authority can be formed by one municipality. But I think in reality, it's going to be several municipalities coming together. And when you have those municipalities coming together, that breeds cooperation. The municipalities want to work together. They want to work to a common goal. They want to make sure the EMS agency is successful. There's the ability to share costs. If one municipality is having an issue with their ambulance service that's part of that municipal authority, other municipalities can figure out a way to help that organization, whether it's financially, with staffing, with vehicles, training vehicles, moving things around so everybody is functioning correctly. And it's also the shared responsibility. These municipalities are getting together for the common goal of providing EMS service. And when there's a common goal, there is a sharing in those responsibilities. And everybody wants to see this be successful. You don't want to be known as the ambulance municipal authority that fails. So there is that incentive inherent in one of these kind of collaborative projects to make sure everything is running correctly and smoothly. Yeah, the, the pooled resources aspect of this is just tremendous. You know, if we have an ambulance, it's, you know, your ambulance is X number of years old and we have other resources uh, within the agency. Same thing with staffing. We hear a lot of folks going out and trying to get staffing from hospitals and other places. This provides the opportunity to leverage those staffing abilities of all those organizations. 
there's also a tax benefit um, within the statute itself. Um, municipal authorities are tax exempt organizations for state law purposes. There's also the ability to gain 501c3 status. So there is that benefit. Most organizations are nonprofits, but if you're a private for profit organization that may be transitioning into a municipal authority and being absorbed, there are tax benefits on that part. Yeah, and last thing here, just uh, to touch on GEMT, Matt, I'll let you explain what it is first. And I know Heather touched on this earlier. Go ahead, Matt. Um, so GMT stands for Ground Emergency Medical Transport Supplement. As Heather said, currently not available in Pennsylvania, but looking out into the future, if this does become something that's available in the state of Pennsylvania, it does require an amendment to the state Medicaid plan. And basically what it allows is through either certified public expenditures or intergovernmental transfers, EMS agencies can be reimbursed near their cost of providing services. Um, one state that does do this, I know for a fact, is California, and some of their reimbursement rates on their Medicaid patients is almost at cost. They're looking at $1,200 per trip almost, which any of you that know reimbursement at the Medicaid level, that's outstanding. So the reason why we bring up GMT is typically GMT programs are only available to publicly owned or operated EMS services. Typically, private nonprofits do not qualify for GEMT. That can all depend on the state plan amendment and how exactly the state plan is set up. However, municipal authorities, if GMT comes to Pennsylvania, I said at the start of the presentation, the majority of EMS services in the state of Pennsylvania are private nonprofits. They'd be excluded from the T program. GMT comes to the Commonwealth and there's municipal authorities, they may very well be able to access a funding revenue that are not available to the majority of EMS agencies. Again, that funding revenue can be a lifeline, especially with the reimbursements we have seen in some states when it comes to GEMT. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of good benefits, you yeah. know, but maybe potentially more funding, um, a little more protection on the liability side, uh, potential uh, um, other opportunities for resources here. So I think for those of you, and obviously this isn't going to be for every organization, but for those organizations who are looking at coverage outages in their communities, this could be a viable option for you. So with that, um, here's a link to uh, some resources where we found a lot of this information. And uh, we'll open it up for any questions that you have in the audience here. Gentlemen, right back here. If you have several municipalities, what's the advantage of forming an authority versus forming a fog under the government? Oh, that's a tough one. I, 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 off the top of my head, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could speak to that. Correct. Um, I would agree with Ryan. And just to reiterate the question, is there any benefits to a municipal authority as opposed to a cog being formed for EMS organizations? Off the top of my head, the differences between the two, I cannot speak to. But any other attorneys at PWW want to speak to that question? You're not attorney. Go ahead. Commission for intergovernmental agreements through a commission. They uh, receive their funding through directly through the municipalities. Okay, the municipalities would tax for that and go to the commission. And uh, the Municipal Authorities Act would have that direct fee to the to the citizens. That's the two differences, I, I believe, in that. There's more legal differences, a lot more than me, but I know the regional police model and re there are regional fire models in Pennsylvania set up through what's called a commission, intergovernmental agreement. Their funding, their budget comes and has to be approved by each participating municipality every year. So there are a few more steps involved in, in that cooperative arrangement. Okay, so there's a subtle, subtle distinction there. We'll follow up with Jerry about that. Um, any other questions before we break for lunch here? Yeah.
has got Perry County looking at doing something. I didn't know if you were in the loop with that. Huh? No. But uh, they're, I think they're trying to do it countywide instead of just, you know, certain municipalities, from what I understand. I mean, I, it, it takes a lot to get your township fathers from different boroughs just to come to the table. A lot of layers to go. get this far, you know, you don't want to see it fall apart, but in, in the long run, it's going to be beneficial for everyone. Yeah, I, I, uh, what this commenter said was he thinks that we're going to see a lot more of this uh, crop up in Pennsylvania. There's really been a clarion call to EMS agencies to come up with uh, better solutions, and it can't just be give us more money, okay? We got to come up with other solutions that are long-term and sustainable um, that do pull those resources in certain cases. So appreciate that comment. Well, oh. yeah, I, oh, go ahead, Eddie. We're going to keep on track for lunch, but... <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, folks, please join me in uh, recognizing Ryan and Matt in their presentation. And what we're going to do now is we're going to turn this into a working lunch. So you, we have about about ten minutes or so. Uh, if it takes fifteen, uh, you know, it's just between us and the TV cameras. Um, we're going to just grab lunch. You can bring it back in here. Uh, and eat, and then we'll do the final presentation and uh, and turn you on your way. So thank you, and we'll see you in a few. So folks, while you're eating, I am going to go ahead and start our final presentation of the day. And that is to discuss the role of EMS in addressing um, social inequalities in emergency healthcare and in EMS in particular, and what we call an overdue imperative. So this is a bit of a departure from what we've been talking about uh, all morning and really what we've been talking about in previous years in this symposium uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of focus on this topic uh, nationally, really. And this is something that our firm is spending uh, a decent amount of time on these days. And when we're not busy doing this kind of educational program and our legal work, we also do a fair amount of consulting work in EMS system design. And I'll talk about where and how we do that in a moment. But I also wanted to introduce some of the other folks from PWW who are here. We've been sort of picking on them sporadically throughout the morning. We've already referred to Ken Brody, who we call Mr. Ken Brody, uh, who was former uh, senior counsel at the Pennsylvania Department of Health, who has now been with us for what, going on 10 years? More than 10 years, 11 years. And uh, behind Ken is uh, Christy Malott, who is of counsel at PWW, has been with us almost since day one, so 22 years. And then uh, another one of our, our partners, Dan Pedersen, who has been with us since 2004. Uh, so I want to thank them for coming out and supporting this, uh, supporting this program as well. And uh, just again, want to thank everybody who's come out uh, to attend this program today. Knowing some of you that your primary field of practice or interest is not emergency medical services, law and policy, we very much appreciate that. Free CLE is free CLE, right? Um, so back to the subject at hand for our closing talk today, and that is the social in inequalities uh, in the healthcare system and in EMS in particular. Um, we developed an interest in this in uh, the context of doing some system design work, particularly in California. And let me just explain for a moment how, I don't need to tell you how different California and Pennsylvania are, but in the ways that their EMS systems are organized in particular. So some of this comes from that context. And that is that in California, they have a somewhat unique structure in their EMS law that allows for counties to designate exclusive operating areas for EMS. And typically how they do that is they put out a request for proposals, an RFP, and then they competitively bid the system so that one usually private company, but sometimes public entities, or what they call JPAs, Joint Powers Authorities, um, will bid on those and become the contractors as well. 
And when they win those contracts, they, they become the exclusive provider for the given operating area, which is often a, an entire county uh, in California. And it may be parts of that county or certain zones within that county. But what that allows the county EMS agencies, which sort of operate like our regional EMS councils do in Pennsylvania, they have some regulatory authority, but I would say that the local EMS agencies in California have a little bit more of a robust oversight responsibility and planning responsibility than what our statute assigns to regional councils in Pennsylvania. But one of the things that that structure allows the counties to do is in those contracts to establish performance standards that the contractor is obligated to uphold. And I'm going to talk uh, for the opening part of this how what we've typically measured, not only in those kind of performance-based contracts, but in other systems, and what we should be measuring maybe instead of or in addition to what we historically measure in EMS. And I can't talk too much publicly about where and, and how we intend to implement this approach that we're talking about here because it's not public yet. We're still uh, in the finishing stages of, of writing a document uh, for one of the EMS agencies in California that we anticipate will be public uh, in early 2023. Uh, so you'll see some of the ideas, but we can't yet talk about where and how we hope those ideas will be implemented within an EMS system, which we think is the first time from an EMS system uh, structure, you know, a system design standpoint, that some of these concepts of social inequality are going to be integrated into EMS system performance. And that's kind of the backdrop of what, uh, what I'm going to talk about here for, for the next few minutes. So I, I want to start off by saying that some of this is still aspirational, right? That law and policy and finance, because payers have a role to play in where we go as a healthcare system, right? I mean, payers can exert enormous influence in incentivizing health outcomes through where they put their money and how they reimburse healthcare providers. And that has happened in other segments of our healthcare system. But those sort of three streams of law and policy and finance, uh, I hope we can elevate this dialogue to make this an aspirational issue where we eliminate statistical differences in the health, in the treatment, and most importantly, in the outcomes of patients in emergency and pre-hospital care in underserved, marginalized, and minority populations. And let me put a quick side note in here for something that Ryan Stark at our firm has worked on uh, nationally and is becoming quite, uh, quite one of the key people, I think, nationally in this dialogue. And that is that a lot of what we do in EMS looks at the delivery of our care, our, our processes, our protocols, you know, how we deliver the care. What we don't yet have fully integrated into EMS is measuring outcomes. What impact did EMS treatment and interventions have on the ultimate outcome of that patient's condition? And the only way we can really do that is to link pre-hospital care information and data with hospital data. And as much as hospitals uh, insist and have a legal, uh, we have a legal obligation to give them the EMS patient care reports, EMS has had much less success getting that follow-up information from the hospitals. And working in contract with NEMSIS, the National EMS Information System, through uh, NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, our firm, and primarily Ryan, has addressed this in a, in a white paper called The Imaginary Barrier that explains why bi-directional information sharing uh, is, is not only permitted under the law, but is really an imperative. And I wanted to talk about that because talking about outcomes in health status is key to a lot of what we're going to talk about today. And we have to break down those barriers. So please check out that white paper. It was a joint product of Nemesis and PWW and that Ryan spearheaded. And I think it's important that we, we remember that ultimately what we're talking about here are health outcomes. Okay, with that, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we often measure now in, in systems across country. And that is the emphasis on response time as in many cases, the sole performance indicator uh, in EMS. And why do we do that, right? Well, we do that for a lot of reasons. And first of all, there was a study 
1979 that sort of set the tone uh, for speed equaling quality in EMS uh, that concluded with patients suffering from out of hospital cardiac arrest, their outcomes were better when EMS got on scene within uh, 48 minutes. So as a result, we built EMS systems as if every call was going to be a cardiac arrest, when in reality, a very small percentage of EMS calls are for cardiac arrest. And as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, it's nowadays, and in most days actually, not really the speed of the EMS response that's going to be determinative of a successful out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in incident. It's going to be bystander CPR, and it's going to be access to automated external defibrillators in public buildings. It's, it's the citizen action, right, that more often than not is going to be determinative of a save in an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. But another reason that systems have been built around performance measurements that include response times is that they're easy to understand and they're easy to measure. And, you know, that has enabled this proxy of speed for quality to be sort of uh, to have evolved over time, where it is seen as a measurement of how, uh, how good an EMS system is. And it's data, right? We can look easily at times from when a call comes in to when an ambulance gets on scene. So it, it, it is data driven, but the question is, is it beneficial to be measuring that at the exclusion of some of these other things that we're going to talk about? And let's not you know, beat around the bush here. This is also a deep seated public expectation. A lot of the public does not complain to their local elected officials and others about, I wanna complain about the quality of clinical care that I received. It's what took you so long? right? And that public expectation of speed is also baked in to many EMS system designs. And that's what the public often perceives as, are we taking their calls seriously? Are we taking their issues seriously? It's by how quickly uh, we get there. And I'm going to talk about why that's a false choice in a, in a minute. And these folks like them. Now, this looks like the UN, but what this is supposed to be is local elected officials, right? That is one hell of a city council chamber, I'll tell you that. But in any event, local elected officials uh, like and understand the accountability that comes with response time performance. And that is another reason that that has largely evolved as one of the principal metrics by which we govern uh, EMS system success. And they tend to see value in speed, right? In, in response time. And it also translates, at least to some degree, into this idea of accountability, that we're holding an EMS provider or an EMS agency's feet to the fire because we require that they respond promptly. So there's all of that going into it as well. Now, among other reasons, in that it can take our eye off the ball of social inequality in, e in healthcare, there's other problems that come with it. Response times have very little to do with patient outcomes, and the data tell us that. Response time looks at the physical features, right? The proximity of an ambulance to an event, basically, is what that's, that's measuring. And it's not always the EMS response time that is determinative of that. Now, I, I do not want to discount the fact that in some cases, time is important in certain medical conditions. And a few of the conditions for which we know that it is are cardiac arrests, certain kinds of heart attacks called STEMI, ST elevated myocardial infarctions, strokes, and many kinds of trauma, particularly, particularly penetrating trauma like stabbing and gunshot uh, injuries. So they are time uh, sensitive. But as I mentioned a minute ago with cardiac arrest, you're going to have more likely a better outcome if a bystander was trained in CPR and an automated external defibrillator was readily available at the time and place of the patient's cardiac arrest. And for other time-sensitive conditions like stroke, like STEMI, like trauma, data are telling us, and as we work more and more in designing these EMS systems, we, get, we drill down into this data, and I'm going to share some of the studies with you here in a moment that it's the total time 
that we take to get the patient to definitive care, the right definitive care, that is more determinative of the outcome than the speed of the ambulance. And I'll, I'll explain, I'm being a little obtuse, but I'll explain that with an example here, all right? Here is example one. Let's say we have a patient who suffers chest pain and calls 911 and the PSAP, the Public Safety Answering Point, our dispatch center, uh, dispatches an advanced life support ambulance. And let's say that that ambulance arrives on the scene in eight minutes. And sort of a national standard has evolved in response times. Eight minutes, 59 seconds, 90% of the time is, pardon me, is sort of that standard measurement. But when they get there, how do we put this? Let's just say the practitioners aren't the sharpest practitioners, sharp, sharpest tools in the shed, I was going to say, right? But you get the idea. Clinically, they're not where they need to be. And they do, do not properly detect that the patient has one of these STEMI events, this ST-elevated myocardial infarction. And based on that missed diagnosis, they transport the patient to a local community hospital that is not an accredited STEMI center. And the data show patients do better when they get to STEMI centers than when they don't. Let's say that after we have our offload delay, of course, because we already talked about that, the hospital accepts care, they do an EKG, they detect the STEMI, and they arrange to get that patient now moved from their community hospital to the accredited STEMI center. The patient gets to a cardiac catheterization lab 94 minutes after the initial 911 call. And that would be pretty quick, actually, if you took the patient to a community hospital to call the STEMI, get interfacility transfer, and get them to a STEMI center. Now, let's look at example two. Same patient, suffers from chest pain, calls 911. The dispatch center sends an ALS ambulance, and it takes the crew this abomination of 18 minutes of response time to get to the scene. But when they're there, they apply a 12-lead EKG, and they instantly detect that the patient has a STEMI, and they take the patient directly to the accredited STEMI center. The patient gets to that STEMI center 12 minutes later, goes right to the hospital's cath lab, and the total eclipse time is 34 minutes from the time of the 911 call to the performance of the PQ, PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention or catheterization procedure. So in our example, statistically, the data are clear that patient number two has a better chance of a satisfactory outcome from their STEMI episode. And there's, there's data that, that tell us that, right? So even though the interval in the response time for ambulance one was quicker, the time that it took to get that patient to definitive care was slower. Patient two had a slower ambulance response time, but with a crew that made the right clinical decision and got the patient to the right destination, and that patient is statistically likely to have a better outcome, right? So this changes how we think about speed, even for the time-sensitive conditions, okay? Now, I always like to ask folks to, to take some of this information and then go to a mythical place with me where Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and unicorns and all of those mythical creatures live, all right? And imagine how public perceptions of EMS would change instead of responding to 911 calls with lights and sirens and hopping out of the ambulance looking like uniformed public safety personnel with badges. We showed up looking like the healthcare providers that we are, nondescript white vans, lab coats and stethoscopes. Now, this is just an exercise in public perception, right? Because the, the guy who we show up for, and it took us 15 minutes, but we had lights and sirens on the ambulance. What took you so long, right? It's the seed of discontent. The other guy goes, holy hell, 
a doctor showed up at my door and it only took 45 minutes, right? And it's amazing how things go full circle in healthcare. I'm looking around the room, I'm not making any generalizations, but I can guess a few people in the room remember doctors making house calls back in the old days, right? I do, I remember that. So, you know, it's interesting how things do sort of come full circle, but this is just a, a mind game in, in public perception, right? Because the public perceptions of EMS are still largely tied to how quickly we respond and attend to their needs and not so much on the delivery of a healthcare service. So all this discussion, you may say, well, what, well, great, this is great, you know, but now we're talking about uh, social inequities in EMS and healthcare. Well, how does that fit in? It fits in because the first part of that is to recognize that what we do is provide healthcare. And if we're going to provide healthcare, we have to look at what healthcare data, evidence, and best practices uh, tell us. What they tell us is that health status is highly dependent upon race and demographics and certain other characteristics. And health outcomes are predictable in many areas based on race, race and ethnicity. I mean, on a macro perspective, folks, it is not a secret that life expectancy is different for white populations than for non-white populations in the United States and in many other countries. But disturbingly, Race and other characteristics also play a factor in the type of treatment that patients receive in their emergency and pre-hospital care. So now I'm going to talk about some of these uh, studies that inform this a little bit. Now, I know I just spent a whole bunch of time telling you why response times aren't the be all and end all, but there is data that show even if we are going to be looking at response times, because we know in some cases they still matter, that there are proven disparities in response times between white and non-white populations. This particular study, as I've highlighted, after we control for zip code, weekday, and time of day in a regression analysis, total EMS time, now we're talking about on-scene and transport, remained 10% longer, translating to 3.8 minutes in the poorest zip codes, which of course also have higher correlations with underserved populations compared to patients in high income zip codes. Uh, and those patients were more likely to meet that eight minute response time standard as we talked about. This study concluded that patients with cardiac arrest from the poorest neighborhoods had longer times compared with those from the wealthiest and response times were less likely to meet national benchmarks in low income areas which the study concludes may lead to disparities in pre-hospital delivery of care over time. Another study that is, uh, I think, important is a study looking at race and sex disparities in pre-hospital recognition of acute stroke. And I'm gonna talk about implicit bias in a few minutes as well, but I think this is an important factor here also. And this looks at recognition of stroke identification of stroke symptoms in patients. And you have to look at implicit or you know, unconscious bias in this on how symptoms and the reporting of those symptoms are reported. But correct pre-hospital recognition of stroke was lower among, among Hispanic patients, uh, Asian patients, and other non-white populations compared with, with whites and, and uh, women, the study concluded finding that significant disparities exist in pre-hospital stroke recognition. And if we do not recognize the stroke and get the patient to the definitive stroke care, right, the time, you know, becomes sort of a secondary issue. Another study looked at racial and ethnic disparities in emergency medical services uh, transport to emergency departments. This study found that 61.3% of white patients were transported to a reference emergency department, and the proportion of Black patients and Hispanic patients going to these reference emergency departments that serve typically more affluent areas, as you can see, was 5.3% and 2.5% uh, lower. Uh, this is a study looking at uh, association of race and ethnicity with emergency department destination of EMS transport. Uh, concluded that race and ethnicity variation 
in the emergency department destinations, uh, you know, found that these underserved populations were more likely to be transported to what we call safety net hospitals, where there's a less acute care options available, probably longer wait times, more uncompensated care, uh, and all that, those sort of fewer ICU beds and all that kind of stuff. Uh, effective socioeconomic status on out of hospital transport delays of patients with chest pain. Uh, high SES neighborhoods were associated with shorter hospital transport intervals with patients having chest pain and uh, calls from the highest socioeconomic status areas are found to be the most likely to receive advanced level EMS care. So you see the case we're building here, right? We're seeing a lot of disparities across a lot of different types of patient care and a lot of types of uh, treatment. Another one that is also disturbing is the administration of pre-hospital analgesia, pain control in white versus non-white populations. There is a significant, statistically significant disparity in uh, black patients being less often treated with analgesics to control pain uh, in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, this study looked at racial bias in pain assessment and treatment including false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites. This study was in a hospital setting or definitive care. It was not EMS, but it's interesting nonetheless. Black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain relative to white Americans, which we just talked about. These findings suggest that individuals with at least some medical training hold and may use false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites to inform medical judgments, which may contribute to racial disparities in pain assessment and treatment. Uh, and this is another study looking at morphine administration, in particular with patients with blunt trauma, which was found to mirror some of the studies in other forms of pain administration. So if we look at some of these inequities in the delivery of care, we have to talk about root causes. And there are also studies looking at the uh, linkage of inequities in care with disparities in the composition of the EMS workforce compared to the populations that those workforces serve, which is not a big surprise. So where we fall short in diversifying that workforce, we tend to see higher data-driven disparities in emergency care. And of course, there are studies that talk about the demographic and uh, racial uh, characteristics of folks working in EMS. Uh, this study looked at the total estimated number of EMTs and paramedics in the United States. This is just interesting data, 216,000 uh, in 2011 to 289,000 in 2019. But looking at the proportion of females uh, it was 31% in 11, it's 35% in 2019, but it showed a significant, so slight increase in the proportion of females in the EMS workforce, uh, significant decrease in um, the proportion of non-Hispanic whites, concurrent increases in other racial and ethnic groups. So some progress being made, but you can see Hispanics make up uh, of, as of 2019, 13% of the EMS workforce nationally. Uh, and you see some numbers for some other uh, groups as well. The study concludes that the, while the number of EMS practitioners has increased over time, that there have only been modest gains in those uh, minority populations. So the growth in Black and Hispanic and Asian and female populations in EMS has not kept pace with the overall growth of the number of EMS practitioners. Um, and this looks at similar data uh, and concludes that the ethnic and racial diversity of the population of nationally certified EMS professionals is not representative of the population served. And this study concluded has not improved at least in the period from 2000 to 2008. Okay, let me stop. Anybody have any questions, comments, anything to add? so far before we talk about implicit bias and some other factors.
Yes. In some, I don't want to put, yeah, let me, let me uh, repeat the question. Would, would I attribute that to a lack of outreach by EMS to those um, underserved populations to become part of our workforce? Yes, I, I would put some of that on the onus on the back of EMS agencies in their recruitment and retention efforts. Um, I, I would put some of that for other socioeconomic factors and demographic factors as well. But I think those factors mean that we have to work harder. And, and I don't think there's been enough of a sustained effort. I'm gonna talk about some shining examples of that where it's, it's been done well, and we can maybe look at those as examples. Yes. So that's a great question. Let me let me repeat it. Um, are there cultural or language barriers that may result in patients refusing care or refusing transport um, for trust issues or any other issues they may have? There are some data looking at that. I know there's some studies going on currently about that. There is some published evidence that came out of the um, opioid epidemic, actually, that looked at racial disparities in overdose deaths. Um, that sort of touched on that, but I, I can tell you that um, that I think ties into implicit bias, which has been established, pardon me, through studies that that exists, and I think um, that's one issue. And another issue, <laughs> I think the more we look like police and public safety, the less trust I think we inspire in the parts of some of our communities. Um, and I think given what's been going on in some communities between law enforcement and those, those populations, I don't think EMS has well served those populations um, by having sort of the public safety appearance, so to speak. And I, I, that may be a controversial thing to say, but some systems are actually looking at, we don't wear badges in EMS anymore. We don't wear uniforms that look like law enforcement, right? For, for largely for that reason, because is part of that implicit bias just that association between EMS and law enforcement? And I'm not saying the association with EMS and law enforcement is a bad thing. We benefit from a close working relationship with law enforcement, but the implicit bias can come in when we don't consider how the populations we serve perceive us. I don't know if that helps your question or just uh, you know confuses the issue or makes people mad, but, um, but that, I think that's an important issue. Um, but let's talk a little bit about implicit bias, uh, and that is our attitudes and our beliefs about race and ethnicity and age and ability and gender. So this is not just racial folks. This could be uh, how we see and treat older patients, uh, patients of a different gender, non-binary patients, um, you know, anyone who is different from us, right? We may have those implicit or unconscious biases, and we have to recognize that those things can surreptitiously influence judgment and without intent contribute to discriminatory behavior. So that's why it's called implicit or unconscious bias. So how can we address some of these issues and how can we uh, hopefully improve equity? First, we can measure the right things. And looking at equity measures in our quality insurance and quality improvement programs is imperative. We've got the data. NEMSIS requires data fields on race and certain other characteristics, right? We can evaluate our population served. We can consider our census and our demographic data of those populations, and we can devise clinical equity metrics. Just as we look at how proficient is paramedic Smith in first attempt intubation, or how often does paramedic Jones comply with ACLS protocols or whatever those clinical measures are, we can look at equity measures as well and make those part of our ongoing assessment of the quality of care, right? We can compare total EMS time and on-scene time and correct destination decision-making and pain administration, analgesic administration for pain patients. Do we get stroke patients transported to stroke centers, for example? We can compare our performance in white versus non-white populations and root out disparities in that care, and then we can address them. But we can't 
improve what we do not measure. And again, if we're spending a lot of time measuring things that are shown not to make a clinical difference, we need to be looking at the things that do, right? So we can incorporate these kinds of metrics into our ongoing quality improvement programs. We also need to address implicit bias in our training and education. This should be a multifaceted approach, scenario-based training, self-awareness, integration, as I said, in QA and QI programs, monitoring and measuring critical performance metrics. Uh, a, a resource that I think is very helpful that I want to point you to is the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office uh, for Minority Health, OMH, which has some great resources on their webpage for implicit bias and awareness and training resources in healthcare generally. Uh, this talks about cultural competency, learning about our own and others' uh, cultural identities, combating uh, biases and stereotypes, respecting beliefs and values of others, uh, gaining new cultural experiences. Cultural humility is another concept that these materials speak about, which I do, again, recommend to you. Uh, another helpful thing in looking at key social identities, right, in populations that we serve, the addressing framework, right, an acronym for the things you see here, considering age and generational influences, disability status, both physical and developmental, uh, disability status for acquired or cognitive disabilities, religion and spiritual orientation, ethnicity, race, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, indigenous heritage, national origin and gender identity, right? Again, these are things that we can use to increase EMS practitioner awareness of the identities of the populations that we're serving. And there are other resources here. I won't spend, don't have the time to go through those in detail. But la the last thing I wanna share is the importance of recruitment and retention of a diverse workforce. The evidence does demonstrate that there are fewer disparities between racial and ethnic groups and demographic groups when the workforce is diverse and more representative of the populations that that agency serves. And one program that I do wanna highlight in response to the earlier question is a program called EMS Core, which is going on in a county in California where they are specifically reaching out to underserved and minority populations within that county to pay for uh, those uh, recruits to go through uh, EMT training. And then also importantly, and you can see the purpose is to increase the a number of unrepresented emergency medical technicians through youth development and job training. Uh, it's a five month paid stipend. So they also get paid to attend the training as well as having the training paid for. And as part of the program, this county agency reaches out to employers in the area to inform them of this program and why it is advantageous for them to hire graduates of this program. So it's both on the training side and in the workforce cultivation side. And I wanted to just quickly point out the organization that funds that project. It's called the Care Star Foundation. Um, and interestingly, there was a for-profit air ambulance company sold to a bigger company in California. Um, I'm sorry, a nonprofit. I might have said for-profit. When a nonprofit organization is sold, usually they have to set up some charitable purpose for the use of those proceeds. And what they did in this case was to set up this charitable foundation with the specific goal of focusing on racial uh, equity uh, in its programming and operations. And it is that organization that funded that, uh, that initiative, the EMS Core initiative. And there are some other initiatives that are in the handouts that if you request an electronic copy of those, we'll be happy uh, to send you that. Now, the other thing I was gonna talk about was the role of civil rights cases, 1983 actions. I'm a little short on time to be able to do that. Uh, but in any event, uh, we do know that of course, on at least on the public agency side, there are an increasing number of cases using section 1983 to address uh, inequalities of care. But of course that's enforcement through the legal system, right? We want to hopefully not get to that point where we can identify the disparities in care, address them through training, address them through data, 
make that part of our continuous quality improvement programs and focus on those things in addition to the other operational and clinical things that we look at. So folks, with that, um, let me thank you all again for attending. Let me again thank Corinna Wilson for helping to put this program together. My colleagues from PWW who helped present all this material, uh, Professor Johnson and the Law and Government Institute, and most importantly, the Widener Commonwealth Law School uh, for their continued support of EMS, public safety, and uh, the military communities. And once again, thank you. And we hope we see you next year. Thank you.